Yeah, we're going. Yeah, Roz likes yeah, to do this thing went. where he just starts. Yeah. Well, usually he doesn't even tell us. No, he'll just start recording. <laughs> All of the slurs that you were saying are still in yeah. there. Uh-oh. Oh, my slur? I didn't say any slurs. I just said the word slur. You said the word slur. Well, the thing is, no, the, the, the slur the, is a the, slur. The, the S word, yes. It's because, listen, I have spent the last two days fighting uh, barstool bros, and uh, my, my average- Love that for you. Yeah, uh, they keep posting, like, listen, I, I'm sometimes self-conscious about my weight and how I look in pictures. My profile Aren't picture, I look good as fuck, dude. I'd fuck me. I would fuck me. Uh, and uh, yeah, Buffalo Liam. Yeah, I'm I'm sexy, man. Uh, it's not it's not my fault. Um. All right. With that, with that, uh, a wonderful, uh, self confident <laughs> opening. Yeah. Normally we don't have that. Yeah. Shall Shall we begin? Yeah, we can begin. Okay. W- welcome to Well, there's your problem. It It's a podcast about engineering disasters with slides. Uh, I'm Justin Rosniak. I'm the person who's talking right now. My pronouns are he and him. Okay, go. I am Alice Goldhall Kelly. I'm the person who is talking now. My pronouns are she and her. Yay, Liam. Yay, Liam. Deep in the process of fighting our fans as well, uh, because Ooh. y'all want to stop <laughs> You're like tagging, that one statue of like the us, guy fighting all the, the babies. Collapse. Yes, that's me. Uh, I do like that someone tweeted the WTYP fight a fan competition. Uh, maybe we do a giveaway Good idea. where you get the chance to fight me. Uh, that's pretty tight. Hi, I'm Liam Anderson. <laughs> My pronouns are he and him. And we have a guest. We have a guest. Yes, indeed. Hi, I am Jason Slaughter from Not Just Bikes, and my pronouns are he, him, and in Dutch, that's hi and hem. Oh, okay. No, and are why? you recording? No, you know what? I'm not even going to make the joke. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, we have, we, have to, we have to avoid the normal slate of Dutch jokes today. That's yeah, right. We'll have that's to put right. those on hold. There might be some uh, Dutch you, listeners. Jason, you personally owe me $500 for the 2010 World Cup loss. All right, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, uh, I accept Venmo or PayPal, so yeah. we're done recording. I'll send that over. Yeah, Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, now, what, what you see on the screen is a man in high vis on a bicycle. Uh, yeah, on some sort of contraption. Yes, on a contraption known as a bicycle. I mean, um, you I'll, see also I'll, here, I'll bite. What, what, what is a bicycle? Well, wait until you uh, hear about this. Well, well it, it's a thing that you, you, you sit on and there's wheels and you pedal and it goes. Oh, I don't like right? the sound of that. I don't think I'd enjoy that at all. <laughs> you should see well, Braz's. Braz has calves the size of cantaloupes. <laughs> that dude could could jump a wall. And then and then you see behind him is a very large, not actually very large by modern standards, actually not large at all, a pickup truck. And then also we see a speed limit 45 sign here. Um and I just noticed there is an di- additional person on a bicycle on, on the, the sidewalk. Yeah. Yeah. Which looking at that sidewalk, I I don't know where I'd take my chance. I guess I just go on the street. Like I I know that I would wipe out because it looks like he's just pedaled past some is this gravel here next to the sidewalk man? It looks or like behind some the gravel sidewalk driveways, yeah. yeah. I would I would absolutely eat shit and break my mouth wide open. Yeah. I, I would take a taxi. Yeah. Uh, what we're gonna <laughs> what we're gonna talk about today is vehicular cycling and oh. John Forrester and the movement uh, 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 therein. Yeah, this um, is the this is the band from Numtots episode. Really, uh, really, you titled that like a like an 18th century treatise, in which well, there's your problem. Uh, discusses <laughs> vehicular bicycling. It's right up there with yes. uh, Leviathan, honestly. Uh, but first, we have to do the goddamn news. Is it the cheese collapse? Did we do the cheese collapse like it's everyone was yelling notes. at us? It's in no. the notes. That doesn't no. look like a cheese collapse. It's in the no, notes. It's oh be a really God. big it's cheese in, collapse. It's in the notes. This is uh, notes? A, a fertilizer factory oh in Winston-Salem. North Carolina. Krispy Kreme. It, is, no. it, is, nor- it is North Carolina, right? <laughs> yeah, it's North Carolina. Yeah. It's where Krispy uh, Kreme is and where Wake Forest University is because Wake Forest University moved out of Wake Forest and moved to Winston Salem, but kept the name. So a fertilizer factory in Winston Salem caught fire on Monday. It's now Friday when we're recording this. It's still burning. 
uh, this is your proper ammonium nitrate fertilizer factory, you know, the one that causes the explosions. This one did not blow up. I'm not quite sure why. I assume it's because they didn't attempt to fight the fire. They just let it burn out. They yeah. Yeah. Instead of letting it, letting it go into the, yeah. yeah, instead of letting it go to the fuel oil factory next door. <laughs> Which is confusingly mm-hmm. placed next to the orphanage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> got an orphanage, they got a nunnery right next door as well. I, I mean, they run the the uh the fuel cars right by Chop in Philly. That's true, yeah. <laughs> um and then and so this is this this was uh they had about 500 tons of ammonium nitrate here. That would cause a pretty sizable explosion if it had exploded. Uh this is right, you know, you see some industrial buildings around here, but this is right in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Oh, Something nice. like a one mile evacuation order uh that was lifted, I believe, this morning. It's now down to one eighth of one mile. Uh so but that it rounds it, that rounds to perfectly safe. Go home. Yeah, so far has not blown up. So I assume it's fine. I um, maybe it's very poor quality fertilizer. Like you would think quality <laughs> fertilizer <laughs> would explode. You gotta get gotta get that good info, which you can't yeah, right? since Oklahoma City. I, yeah. This is very this is like a little a little microcosm of the like you have to go back to the office thing of this thing is still just smoldering. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you can go back to your house. It's probably yeah, fine. It's probably fine. Don't breathe in too deep, though. Yes. Um, in other news, the cheese aisle collapsed at the oh. Acme on Oregon <laughs> Avenue. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. The next person to tag us in this, uh, he's got to get the ball. I didn't hear about uh, this. Tell me more. It was it was the day before Joe Biden went to visit this cheese aisle as part of his Build Back Besser program. Um, and, and and right before uh, he was I able to do you that, mean build back cheddar. <laughs> I that's I, some. I was trying to do something with brie Jesus because of the Christ. bee, and yeah. I couldn't. I, I couldn't get there. So yeah, no, I, uh, you kudos. did it, Liam. Good job. Uh, yeah, yes. I I've become the very thing I sought to destroy. Uh, very very good upon. Shut the hell up. <laughs> 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 you know it's pronounced chowda. Well, he said underneath 30 layers of blackface. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm going to start mispronouncing things like this just for further annoyance. Yeah, the guy's called Vincent Van Gogh. Oh, Uh, well, okay. I'm not going to be triggered. (laughs) (laughs) Go lose a World Um, Cup about it and then send me $500 to make up for my losses. I want, I want to be clear that I know it's von Hoch. I just, you know, don't respect uh, Dutch as a language. You yeah, gotta no, work on your... Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is funny. The people that originally posted this, the Philly Plain Dealer, actually DM'd us on Twitter to say, huh. people keep tagging you in this <laughs> post we made. And, we, and I actually sent back, like, yeah, like, here's, here's just the tags from today like we know <laughs> <laughs> so uh shout out to the philly plain dealer i guess uh i don't know their politics they'll get mad at me yeah. uh, but if they're in south philly i assume they're terrible <laughs> yeah so anyway go 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 down to oregon avenue uh and support gulp. acme so they can rebuild this no, go uh, and gulp. push on push on don't the, go like, to acme dude acme sucks ass yeah <laughs> push on the caution type they've it's they've, like, they've set up it's always yeah. so expensive. They never have the shit you need. Like I, dude, I fucking hate shopping at Acme. There's one right near my house. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I live in North Philly, and uh, there's one right near my house, and it just it fucking sucks all the time. But they do have beer at that one at least. Oh, that's good. Do they have beer at yours, Ross? Um, yeah, they have beer at the. Uh, the oh yeah, Acme they still on they my side. Yeah, they inherited that yeah. liquor license. Exactly. Got yeah, grandfathered in. Uh, actually, if you want a real good experience, uh, go to the Trader Joe's at 22nd and Market. No. Yes, go there. No. Go there. Uh, bring a sword. Uh, you will need it. I was about to say, I mean, every time I see that place, there's like a line that goes out and around the parking lot and out the building and onto Market Street. And I don't understand. You can't even shop there because if you miss no. something, the line it, goes through the entire store. So it, you only have one chance to pick stuff out it's of the not aisle. for <laughs> shopping. It's a place to have a tactical experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, you know what I learned the other day? Uh, Pico has two employee only surface lots uh, in between. You know where the Pico building is and then the Trader yeah. Joe's and how there's two surface lots there? Yeah. Those are just Pico employee lots. Really? And like you can just park there and go to Trader Joe's if you're a Pico employee. 
Wow. Uh, so I I don't know what I'm going to do with this information, but you I guess I'm, job to, at Pico. I'm not fucking getting a job at Pico. I can't answer the phone right now, dude. I'm recording. <laughs> <laughs> That's the guy from Pico trying to call you. <clears throat> offer you a job. He's trying to headhunt you. Yeah. I don't know. Is there like even a good, like, what's a good grocery store in Philly? That's the real question. I think you have to go to like the Fresh Grocer on 56 to get like a good grocery store that's worth what? going to. The Aldi, at, no, the Aldi's fine at yeah. whatever, 43rd and Chestnut. Uh, welcome back to Philly Talk, where we're yeah. just talking yeah, it's about- it's a podcast, it's a podcast uh, about yeah. supermarkets. I yeah. Yeah. Says, Apparently. actually, I like the giant at 23rd and Arch. I can tell you about my local Albert Hein. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Some kind of freak Dutch supermarket. <laughs> There's also Jumbo that's pronounced Yumbo. 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 I like that. Um, <laughs> personally, personally, as, 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 a, as a Scot, I love to go to Big Tesco. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Some of my favorite shit to do. Yeah, I oh. had a nice Tesco Metro around the corner from where I lived in London, and uh, that was where I did all my shopping. Exciting shit. Uh, the call was to let me know that I brought my girlfriend's sister's laptop back from the dead. Uh, don't contact me about tech. I'm not All having right. a good day with it. <laughs> uh, uh, the, 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 uh, there's a giant now on Delaware Ave, Roz. You could just uh, bike there. I, I'm not going to bike to Delaware why Ave. Don't you, why don't you go to the Acme on Grace Ferry, dude? That's a good one. I, well, I guess they fixed the bridge so News. you can bike over it now. <laughs> yeah, this has been grocery <laughs> store. I'm totally yeah. the record on, on this. <laughs> Listen, I'm oh I'm a woman God. of some patience, but not infinite patience. <laughs> uh, uh, so bikes. Okay, oh, what? Oh, you bikes. can use a bike to get to the grocery store. Now, if you look at the diagram mm -hmm. I've drawn yeah. here, yes. <laughs> okay, I have a video about that. What, what's everyone experience here with bikes? Uh, me and you biking home from the bar at two a.m. after my ex girlfriend fell asleep and wouldn't let us sleep at her apartment, and then uh. Biking home in the rain oh, and, chafing so, and chafing so bad I threw up in the shower the next day because I was in what? so much pain. Jesus, the next dude. day? I'm fat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that, that's a full body chafe. That was, be that, was, uh, that was before uh, Philly, was, uh, Philly's actually, bike share had was was you in a was, wind tunnel. I was actually throwing up because I was violently hungover. And, uh, yeah, same difference. Yeah, yeah. But, you're throw, but you're throwing up chafed is the thing. My, my experience with bikes is uh, my dad tried to teach me to ride one, and much like everything else in my life, it got too difficult and I just decided I didn't want to do it anymore. So nice. I've ridden a bike with training wheels on. I've never ridden a bike without training wheels on Damn. in my life. All right. Please well. do not use this information <laughs> to own me. <laughs> well, for me, I mean, it's, it's not just bikes. Um, <laughs> he said they, the thing. I, I get it. I did it, right? I got the, I got the name of the channel in there. Um, for me, I don't know. I, I didn't ride bikes until I got desperate because the streetcar in Toronto was so shit that I had to get to work some other way. And I went and bought a bicycle. And that was when I was like, I don't know, 28 or something. Um, but that was like it. And then I didn't do it for a while. Now I live in Amsterdam, so I ride it every single day. Ah. My my experience, I guess, with bikes is, uh, you know, I, I I use it for most of my trips. I would say here in Philly, unless it's like raining or snowing, or it's way too cold. Um, you see. know, it's a lot of it's a lot of it's on street biking. I had a bicycle commute that I did for a while out to a job in Media, Pennsylvania, and I did a good. 14 miles of vehicular cycling each way. Because the thing uh, is man. about you, Justin, is that you don't, you don't fear death, right? You're going to yeah, go so... I have, I have, I, I, I have, I have certain amounts of fears of death. Actually, I have significantly more fear of death than I did back then yeah. in college. <laughs> You're um, still going. Yeah. You're still going to like Catholic Valhalla, right? Whereas me, right? I, I, I think I would cycle if I lived in Amsterdam, right? I would learn because. I would you want to, to. Right. yeah, yeah, I, because I have to, and because I want to be a statuesque blonde woman with like one of those like curvy bikes, and just like riding that shit over cobblestones in high heels, like it's no big deal. I would do that yeah. shit if my if my city provided for that kind of aesthetic cycling, I would do that. Instead, the kind of uh, cycling that Glasgow provides for is you are nudged out of your cycling lane into a brick wall by an HGV at like sixty miles an hour. <laughs> that sounds about right. That's exactly yeah. why I didn't cycle when I lived in London. I did actually cycle um, from the train station to work when I lived in Cam uh, when I worked in Cambridge. 
So that was another bit of cycling. Okay, Cambridge, Cambridge is all like fucking fine. dreaming spires. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, it's pretty dodgy down. Well, it was at the time down by the station. I don't know how it is these days, but once you get in the center of town, it's all, you know, pedestrian. You still nerds. have to watch for those, those buses and the nerds. Yes. The nerds. So I, I, I guess this means I'm the, I'm the person with the most experience doing the horrible kind of cycling we're going to talk about today. I think that's probably <laughs> true. I mean, I did yeah. some in Toronto, but I mostly stuck to like, I only cycled in the areas where they made the protected bike paths and I didn't cycle really at all um, outside of that as much as possible anyway. Yeah. Roz is familiar with, with, uh, I, I, I do love your, your stories when I come over uh, and I tell you how I was almost assassinated, and you tell me how you were almost assassinated. Yes. <laughs> well, I'd say the worst part of that commute was like the last mile on Providence Road. Because oh, it was yeah. mostly all low speed roads until that last mile where you had Providence Road. It's like a two lane road. You know, it's signed for 35 miles an hour, and everyone does 70. Um, that sounds about and right. You're just, there's no shoulder, and you're just sort of crammed over there at the edge. You know, because it's also dead straight, so it's like I have no excuse to not let people pass. Um, <laughs> I'm so happy you don't yeah. work there anymore, Jesus no, I Christ. Say, I only did it twice a week. I took the train over other days. But yeah, I know, because like... I, I drove you to the train. <laughs> yeah. Because I had to drive out to fucking King of Prussia. Build the train to King of Prussia. I have some difference of opinion on that, but that's outside of the... Uh, that's a the, purview. The, 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 yeah, outside the Beyond purview the of Beyond the scope podcast. of this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> All right, back yeah. to grocery yeah. chat. Yeah, back, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, bicycles, they sort of show up around the 1810s. Uh, you get your early push bar bicycle, your dandy horse, right? That's just, mm. you know, it's a piece of wood with two wheels. And, and it was like that they were that rich. That sounds like a homophobic slur. I'm not <laughs> going to lie dandy to you. Dandy horse. <laughs> It was, it's so funny to see those, well, I guess drawings from back then. Cause there's these rich dudes, uh, in, in these fancy dress going around on these, like these pet, these th- like bike bikes without pedals, like the kind of things that two year olds uh, cycle on today. It just looks so yes. ridiculous. Um, this was the most dignified way of getting around at that point. Oh yes. Yes. By, uh, by the 1860s, uh, the type of bicycle we now call a penny farthing was developed. Yep. Uh, someone with the big St- wheel still and the in small use wheel. in Shoreditch. <laughs> I, every once in a while, I, I see someone, there's like a, a group of a couple guys in the city who ride penny farthings on the Schuylkill River Trail. And every time I see them, I'm like, these chuckle fucks. <laughs> <laughs> they're, That's they're why not, Roz carries around a spear mm, gun. Yeah. Um, you, you, you look at, they're, they're even like modern penny farthings. Like they have like modern composite frames and crap like that. Like racing stripes. <laughs> it's a oh. racing penny farthing. <laughs> the penny, penny farthing super Lagara. Um, and then, um, and then by the, uh, 1880s, you see sort of the first recognizable modern bicycles with the two wheels that are equal size. You got the, the chain and the pedals, you know, you got all this crap. Yeah. Whoops, we accidentally invented one of the most efficient methods of personal transportation as a joke. One of the most efficient methods of locomotion of living beings, period. That's um, pretty shocking, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is the problem with nature, is they couldn't figure out how wheels worked. Evolution has just <laughs> never done those, it. Those <laughs> dumb tigers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> imagine imagine you're just in the jungle and you see the first wheeled tiger yeah. doing a fucking mechanized advance towards you. I think oh. uh, we, yeah, we would not oh have evolved. Oh my god, it's, fl- it's learned to flank. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the rover here that's pictured. This is the one that was invented in Coventry in the UK. Ooh. Now a shitty place to cycle. Nice uh, springs on the seats. I should say I've walked two miles today in the freezing cold, and I'm eating dinner because it's my first chance to do so. I'm not intentionally freezing Jason out so that everything he says <laughs> is followed by a solid five <laughs> seconds of dead silence. I am doing it on purpose. Yeah, yeah we, we knew that. <laughs> sort of the, in the 1890s, bicycles are very, very popular. This is sort of the first golden age of cycling, right? As they called it. Um, you know, because everyone's using bikes to get around. Uh, you know, bicycles become popular, they're cheap. They're very easy to learn, so on and so forth. They were very popular with women, actually. Oh, yeah, it's an early implement of feminism. It is an mm-hmm. early implement of Absolutely. feminism, because women could now leave the house uh, without the company of their husband and travel long distances very easily. 
And they had those step through frames for the dress. Oh yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. It's like one of the two terrors of the Victorian man, the bicycle and the post box, because she can fucking mail, she can write letters to anybody, including like other dudes, without you knowing about it, without her having to talk to anybody. Can and you imagine? then she can, she can go and cycle off to meet them and get fucked by them. Whereas oh previously, <laughs> previously, like, you know, the, 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 the giga chad, the next village over, has to have like a horse. And that's like a limiting fact. To. Yeah, she, she's she's mailing a a, a deraga type of her ankle. <laughs> yeah, her, yeah. <laughs> I am so hard. Stop! I cannot wait to see you at the next county ball. And a derogatype. A derogatype is like an insulting daguerreotype. Daguerreotype. Excuse me. Uh, the, I, yeah. listen, I was I just oh. watched a telegraph joke. So now now bicycle. Bicycle usage uh, sort of starts to taper off in the early part of the 20th century, though, and that's because of some of the stuff we did to streets, right? Ruined them, yes. Ru yeah, yeah, fucked them up. This is Dock Street in Philadelphia in 1906. Wow. You just yeah. said that like you were a native of here, and I am so <laughs> proud of you. <laughs> Good, Good for you. Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Good for you, Roz. That's like when I say Toronto. Yeah, mm. the, the second T is silent, and otherwise they, they, they hurt you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I watch CP24 and uh, sort of squint to see oh, what's happening yeah, up dude, in the corner. It's like disassociating. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> when it's up in the little little TV in the bar and you're trying to yeah, yeah. read the news, the goddamn it's, news. Yeah, and there's too much text. You're overwhelmed. It's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> Just sort of let you, it wash over you. True you Canadian know this experience. shit has happened to me when I start calling it Glesco, which I will never do. <laughs> Glesco? Yeah, like yeah. Glasgow or like if it rhy I don't rhymes know. with Tesco. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, no, I, I, I have a, I have a useful <laughs> instructional drop here of how not to say the name of my sissy from the movie The Thomas Crown Affair. Not bad for the wee lad from Glasgow. 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 Yeah. Glasgow. That doesn't that doesn't even feel real. <laughs> Cause it isn't. Uh, I don't even know where I am, man. Uh, Philadelphia for your sins. <laughs> so you pre automobile Streets. street, you have uh you have um you know you got horses and carts. You got a distinction between the sidewalk and the cartway, right? The cartway is the roadway, the sidewalk is the sidewalk. Right, uh, yeah. but the the cartway is sort of you know the carts go there, but you can also walk there. You might not want to because it's full of horse poop, but you can do that. Um, yeah, yeah. This no, was the no, amazing no, like, thing, like hmm. um, the fact that you could walk anywhere you wanted, and the sidewalk was there so that you didn't have to step in horse shit. It wasn't like yes. you had to walk in the sidewalk. It was there for your convenience. And yeah, there's no like marked crossings, right? But in the, in the <laughs> later stages of this. You do get some like traffic signals, right? Like fucking uh, boards that you swing out that like say stop and go, right? I think the first uh, documented like formal traffic control was on London Bridge. I think in like the 1600s, uh, before Damn. the fire, um, they uh, they they separated it into two way traffic. Wow. Um, hmm. Yeah, uh, that was that was. Um, uh, but, uh, but I guess the first separation, though, was the sidewalk and the cartway. Ancient Roman cities uh, had that. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's been, been there for a long time. That's because and they did have was... marked crossings, because they had, they like, did. stones that you could step over the tracks, so you wouldn't get, like, shit on your sandals while you were trying yeah, to, but like, cross the street. The street was literally an open sewer. Yes, that's also true. <laughs> um, well, then we, we, we developed this thing called a car, and the cars go fast. Um, mm. This is, I believe, Ooh. I don't know what to Mich think about those. Yeah, mm. this is, I think, Michigan Avenue in Chicago, um, and you, you, you know, you start doing lane markings, you start doing traffic control devices like traffic lights. You know, I, I like this left turn only lane here because they they have you turn left before the island here, and also this, <laughs> so this like, arrow is very right stylish. In front of it's cute. It's traffic. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I do love these old streets, though. Like, they don't have any lane markings. You just kind of, it's still a free for all. Yeah, it's all in yeah. South Philly now, <laughs> today. <laughs> so, no one knows how illegal what you're doing is. Um, but with, uh, with these, uh, the mass produced automobile, of course, everyone's driving fast. Uh, that means the automotive industry invents the concept of jaywalking. 
Uh, they have to kick all the people off the streets so people can drive the car faster. Yeah, um, this is not a thing in yeah. the UK. So, yeah. like, jaywalking is when you you cross the street not at a marked crossing, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's so funny when um, when I first moved to the UK and was working in Cambridge, I used to like wait for the lights. And I remember uh, one of my coworkers said, "You cross the street like a Canadian." <laughs> <laughs> Politely, that feels like a yeah. slur. You wait for the like the little green guy to show up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Whereas, uh, I I have only been yelled at for jaywalking once. It was in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, um, and I was like, "You expect me to walk all the way down, like five hundred feet that way, and walk off five hundred so feet?" Back? Everyone, j- everyone jaywalks in Jim Thorpe anyway. It's, mm. it's, a, it's a tourist town. Fuck off. I, I couldn't figure out what the guy was yelling at me for for like five minutes until he, he and then, uh, oh, jaywalking. I, I forgot that was a oh, thing. Oh, not a real fry. <laughs> Got it. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, this you know, jaywalking thing is, it's it's an American thing, but it, it kind of has culturally come to Canada. Like where I'm from in Ontario, Canada, jaywalking is not a law. Like there's no law against jaywalking, but everybody thinks there is. Um, and, and you'll sometimes get drivers who will like enforce it by leaning on their horn to teach you a lesson or something, but wasn't, it's not illegal what, to cross the street anywhere you want in Ontario. that giant like billboard, like warning you of the dangers of, 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 um, of Jay oh, Montreal, right? Oh that yeah. Was, that, that was in, in, in Quebec. Uh, Montreal. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So apparently yeah. it is, uh, well, actually I'm not sure if it's illegal in Quebec. I know it isn't like New Brunswick or some other lame province like that, but, um, but oh, oh my god one, one of the one of the Irvings was yeah. like no no no, no none I, of I this to, I need to run a pipeline through here <laughs> <laughs> so so during this during this period there's lots and lots of traffic accidents most of them are fatal because the cars have no safety devices whatsoever um, they run down pedestrians they run down cyclists they run down uh, mothers with baby carriages they run down nuns crossing the street orphans, orphans you know everything yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we'll make sure you got that in there and uh and and they um they basically sort of becomes less popular during this era because it gets more difficult to do it's um, more of a like leisure activity and less of a like mode of transportation right yeah because you don't want to die mm. and this is uh there was some uh before this era there was some consideration for separate bicycle infrastructure but one thing that's going to be very relevant to our story is britain from about 1937 to 1940 there was a, a provision in the Ministry of Transport's uh, uh, grant codes that to build an arterial road, local councils must include nine foot cycleways on both sides of the road. Damn. Right? That's, that's not a bad idea. Well, it's a pretty good idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't think they and have it, that anymore. No, um, no, no. I'm not seeing a lot of no. nine foot cycleways. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of them are still there. They're just overgrown. No one maintains them. Actually, it's um, like Stevenage has a whole bunch of them, apparently. I don't know. Yeah, I've never been to, to Stevenage. Stevenage. I've just been through yeah. the, the station <laughs> on my way to Cambridge. It's so they, quite enough, I think. They built 280 miles of road with these uh, nine-foot cycleways on both sides. And some of them were very high quality, uh, done by people who you know considered the implications of having these cycleways. How do you treat intersections? Stuff like that. Uh, there's not really any formal design guides. And the others were like, the local council was like, all right, yeah, we'll pave something, whatever. I don't give a shit. Um, and those were really bad ones. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember reading um, this stat. I think it was on that blog, A View from the Cycle Path. He's a British guy who lives in the Netherlands now. Um, and, and he had some stats that said that there were more people cycling in the United Kingdom than the Netherlands until like 1974 or something like that. Oh, wow. That sounds about right. Huh. Um. You got, I mean, a lot of those, a lot of those uh, old villages are very well set up for cycling just inherently. Yeah. Um, we got to, we got to return. We got to be trans for this shit. Well, it's like Absolutely. how uh, Philadelphia has the, uh, the highest mode share of cycling of any major U.S. city, despite having barely any cycling infrastructure. Blow me um, New York. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that just because like shit's close together there? Everything's close we, together. The we streets are very, are very narrow. The northeast, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the streets are very narrow. Yeah. Um, honestly, there's parts of the city where I, you just shouldn't drive. You could theoretically, but, mm-hmm. but like, uh, it, it's 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 very it, it's much easier to get most places with a bike, especially yeah. like wonder, South Philly. Yeah, I wonder if Glasgow was like this before we ran an enormous motorway through the middle of it. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's a bad idea. Hmm. Oh, but Glasgow so, has that nice, like, circular uh, subway that you've had um, since forever and never did any, mm-hmm. but anything mm-hmm. else? Uh, well, what we yeah. should do is take the trains out and you can just cycle through it. Just underground. Bad put, idea. put you on the rails. Hell yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. Be like cycling hyperloop. <laughs> yeah. A cycle loop. So someone someone proposed that in London for abandoned underground tunnels. And the issue being there's not that many of those and they don't go anywhere useful. They don't form a useful yeah. network. <laughs> you think if they went somewhere useful, there'd be underground trains in them. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I could cycle you know, five hundred feet from Aldwich and back. Um, yeah, you can you can go through like an old continuity of government bunker. Great. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, that'd be pretty fun though. That would be um, fun. So surprisingly, who comes out against this cycleway plan? It was the British Cyclist Touring Club, right? What why? Uh because they knew these cycleways weren't great, they weren't gonna be very well maintained, but it, the main thing was it ceded the main roadway to cars. They couldn't bike on the street anymore. This is, they this had is, to this bike is... on the path. This is still a particular like uh, thing of the British cyclist to this day. It's like you don't have to like negotiate around the traffic because you are the traffic. Yeah, and it's like yeah, yeah. Hmm. F- fair enough. Like in principle, yeah, you have as much right to be there as a car. Yeah, but if you try and cycle defensively like you are a car, what actually happens is you are turned into fucking chunky marinara. Right. Right. And the other thing is, this is uh, this is a touring club, right? So this is sort of an enthusiast group. A uh, guys who love to bike fast, you know, they're they're um, they're all on the penny farthings, listening yeah. to chat pop. Yeah, exactly. They're going, they're going. Uh, they're 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 sort of our our proto lycra guys, you know. Um, well, lycra before lycra, they like yeah, lycra exactly. before it was popular. Proto lycra. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, but they're not necessarily people who you know they just want a relaxing bike ride to get where they're going. They're they're mostly people who are going pretty fast. You know, they're cycling in like big groups. They're doing they're they're, they're almost racing. You know, but um, mm. you know, so this is this is going to be a theme. Um, mm. Now, so this this sort of program dies off during WW two because Britain had more important things to do, like um, almost joining and then uh, beating the Germans. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the the fun thing is that like. We had fuel rationing until the fifties, I think. We had a blackout that, like, you couldn't have fucking lights on your cars and shit, except like for really heavily dimmed ones. And and yet, and yet, we fell in love with the car, and we stayed in love with the car, even maybe because we associated bikes with the like the hardship of wartime. And so, as right. a consequence, we all figured like, ah, oh, once the war is over, you know, you. You live more Americanly. You get to drive your big yeah. car to your like, you know, subdivision house. In the meantime, or not even in the meantime, over in the next, parallel. Like, in parallel, yeah. Um, and and probably Jason can speak on this better than I can. In in the Netherlands, they did what everyone else did, which is redesign streets to be for cars. And then there was this huge backlash because the cars kept killing kids. And yeah, uh, I- as was uh, happening, imagine, like, imagine doing something about dead kids. That, that's <laughs> that's the America. big difference. That's the big difference. Yes. Yeah. The, the thing was, like, this was happening all over the world. You look at accident statistics from the '70s, just about anywhere, and it was like that's where everything peaked. Um, and there was the oil crisis too at the same time. Um, and and the Netherlands, they happened to turn that into action to you know start uh, making their their streets less car friendly. In North America, we got right turn on red. <laughs> I mean, right. United States that was a, that was only a, like I came out of the oil crisis, right? Yeah, we got right yeah. turn oh, on a, red. That was, a, that was a fuel economy thing. Yeah, yeah your, your only <laughs> gift to civilization a right turn on red. A right turn yes. on red. That's what we thank, get. Thank you, Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> yeah, I was going to um, say. <laughs> I've heard that joke before. <laughs> <laughs> but the the thing is, was when I've read this this history of this stuff. Um, you know, a, a lot of, well, a lot of people just don't know shit about this, but even people that read a bit about it, they think that, you know, all these kids were getting killed. There was the Stop the Kinder Mord movement. And suddenly everyone was like, oh, yeah, we shouldn't stop killing children. We should, well, we should stop killing children. And they we, suddenly we think, shouldn't. We, we shouldn't. shouldn't. Yeah. 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 That's a school reopening. <laughs> well, let's think about this. Right there. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, we got Emily Oster on the pod. The truth <laughs> of the matter, though, is that like when you look at the, you know, the the city council votes to like not run a highway straight through the center of Amsterdam, that these things lost by like one or two votes. It was not some unanimous thing. It's not like everyone here was like, oh, kids are being killed by cars and cars are destroying people's houses. So let's stop doing this. Most people were still like, no, yeah, okay, that sounds like a pretty good idea. It's all right. And then there was just barely enough people to stop it. There were like fist fights and oh, stuff there about fist fights, installing... there were riots. There was Oh Jesus. It was crazy. There's there's video online of like people literally having fist fights over uh some people here in De Pipe closing off one of the streets, which De now pipe. is De Pipe. Oh, yeah. I yeah. love, De love pipe. to give her De Pipe. Yeah, <laughs> it's literally <laughs> the pipe. Yes. <laughs> Sure, I'll have a name of that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> taking my romantic vacation to the pipe. <laughs> yeah, having I mean. my honeymoon in the pipe. Yeah. It's a nice neighborhood yeah. nowadays. Some Wasn't people so nice. Pound town, but I no. like something a little more exotic. You like yeah, going to the European, pipe. yeah, the pipe. It's a very silly country. <laughs> it's, oh, it absolutely is a silly country. You should hear them speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, 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 Jason has done uh, several slides here explaining some of the theory of cycling, especially as it applies in like places like the Netherlands, as opposed to what we'll discuss later. Uh, so let, let, let's go through those. Yeah. Do you want me to take over here? Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, you, right. you, you be just do this. Yes. Congratulations. Hello, hello you've been, new Roz. Death yeah. to old Roz. <laughs> Congratulations, you've been promoted. Uh, w- welcome to uh, Well, There's Your Problem. It's a podcast with slides. So here is the... <laughs> this actually comes out of Portland, this first one. Uh, yeah. This is the type of cyclists. Um, and uh, this is the idea that there's basically four different types of cyclists. There's the INTP, EFTJ... Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Capricorn. <laughs> <laughs> it's the uh, Myers Briggs of cycling. Act of service. Uh, <laughs> Mercury rising. <laughs> <laughs> so we have our strong and fearless. The people who are willing to get on a bicycle, like they just love cycling. They just they'll bike no matter what. Yeah. Uh, then you Justin, have your oh, young Justin. That, that is Bradley. Justin, young Justin, young I, Roz. I don't know if I'm dropping go, soon. Can I go fling myself into a highway for oh, exactly? Trucks. Like, fuck it, we're doing this. <laughs> and then there's the enthused and confident. I think this is probably what I was when I was younger. Um, people willing to bicycle if some bicycle specific infrastructure is in place. Um, I'm not that anymore. I got kids, so now I'm probably the interested but concerned. People willing to bicycle if high quality bicycle infrastructure is in place. Hey, that's me. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think, to be honest, I think that's most people. And then there's the no way, no how. People unwilling to bicycle even if high quality bicycle infrastructure is in place. Um, now, I actually think that the real number of people that are no way, no how is very, very small. But I can understand that if you've only ever grown up in the US, this is a perfectly reasonable position to take. Because yes. I think I would have had this position. Uh, when I was in my early 20s, I would have been like, there's no fucking way I'm getting on a bicycle. Are you kidding me? I'm not <laughs> 12. Gay? It's a one way to get to death town. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, I grew up in a very car infested city uh, called London, actually. <laughs> I gotta say, some of those uh, cycle super highways are pretty pathetic when they were first implemented. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my hometown doesn't even have that. So... The idea here is that there's these different types of cyclists and there's only like they're, they're going to only cycle in certain conditions. So there was this thought originally that the strong and fearless was less than 1%. These are some of the, the uh, statistics that they got from interviewing actual people in you know, Berkeley, Portland, Edmonton, and some made the 50 largest metros in the U.S. So you can see here that the vast majority of people are in the interested but concerned. And I think that's probably realistic. I think the no way, no how, again, is probably a bit bigger like, than, it, than it really is if people were exposed to it more. I think all of this kind of shifts as you're exposed to it more. I think even more people become strong and fearless as they get used to it. But um, this is the idea. 
Yeah, Let's I mean, move you on. Know, if, if, once all your friends start biking, you might start biking too. You exactly. Know, it's a good time. Just exposure. Peer pressure. Peer pressure. Yeah, peer pressure. Yeah. It's, it's all about peer cycling pressure. There. It's literally <laughs> the only reason why anybody cycles is because of peer pressure. It's true. <laughs> yeah. So this um, is statistics. They're a bit ancient from 2007 um, that I pulled from a view from the cycle path. Um, but this is about cycling in the Netherlands. And the, the graph on the left here shows the... Uh, Gonna love this is all in Dutch, but I love to feed certain. Yeah, the, the feeds written per pusun that I and I'm not gonna try. This, this 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 offends me in two different ways. One is a speaker of English and one is a speaker of German. But getting both of them wrong. I know, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> you, you think Dutch is annoying and then you learn German and it's so much worse. Yes. Yeah. Do you yeah. like compound words? <laughs> German does more compound words than the Dutch, but I can see one of them there. There's what, like, Fiets ver Platzingen? Nar motif? Anyway. Man, fuck you, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think oh, I have here in the notes, Liam's going to give me shit about this being in Dutch. So Yes. That, there, hey, you mm -hmm. right there you go. I'm right on cue. So anyway, the first graph here is showing how uh, this is across the entire country of the Netherlands. This is not just the big cities. This includes small towns, rural areas, everything else. And it shows by age how often people ride on average each day. And so you can see that pretty much everybody of all ages cycles here, uh, at least occasionally. So you get into like the, the younger kids, they cycle quite a lot. And then as they get into working age, you, you're down below about one cycle trip for per uh, day and as you get older it goes up and i mean this this is what i see here in the netherlands is that there's everybody cycles here it's not just you know some 20 somethings clad in lycra or fearlessly barreling down the street it's literally something for everyone and the other pie chart here is interesting too because what they found is that only 16%, now this is the entire uh, country, the, the, the big cities are much higher than this, but only 16% of people here cycle to work. And uh, the bottom one there is, is 18% to school. So yeah, what you 22 find- 22% spent their time cycling for something called Bootschappen. Bootschappen, <laughs> yeah. You know what? That was, that's actually the topic of this podcast, grocery shopping. <laughs> <laughs> We did it. I am so proud. I, 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 love, I love to shop for my boots. Yeah. <laughs> so, Winkelin and Bootschappen is shopping and grocery shopping. Um, and you can see it's 22%. So, like, and this is another thing that's really interesting about the Netherlands is because when you talk about cycling in other countries, everybody's focused on the, the commute. It's right, getting people to cycle to work. There's lots yes. of people here who. Uh, drive to work, take public transit, walk to work, um, and they still ride bicycles. And I think that's what's interesting, because if you looked at this from like, the like mode share point of view that they talk about in the US, only 16% of people ride a bike to work. So that would be the bicycle mode share. But it, it, it's interesting because this is like uh, borne out in other forms of like uh, transportation engineering, especially yeah. here in the United States, you have like whole systems like commuter trains are geared exclusively to the nine to five work commute and right. nothing was, else. Right, yeah. Roz, what was it that you struggled with? All that? Was it VRE? Not VRE, Virginia, that like only ran uh, Virginia like Railway Express. Yes, it ran trains in the morning into town. It yeah. ran trains in the evening out of town. Uh, um, it was horrendously inefficient because in order to do six trips in the morning, they needed five train sets um, yep. and five crews. And then they did six trips in the evening with that same that's, and there was a split shift in the middle, which must have been miserable for the people working there. Um. That's always been sort of sort of my thing with uh, just like SEPTA, you know, exclusive of the trolleys, uh, which run basically 24 hours. And I guess used to know, run basically 24 yeah, hours. Yeah, so. you're right. You're right. <laughs> I, I'm still getting used to the new normal. Uh, I, I always think about this with like even getting the fucking maniac which is what five miles from us. If that is like impossible, just based on, Oh, we've stopped running the trains at nine 30. Yeah. yeah. And it was and the like, same thing with, um, with the go train in Toronto. When I lived there many years ago, um, it's, it's better now, although there's still some lines that run exactly like what Roz was talking about. You know, there's four trains that come into downtown. Then they sit there on the most expensive mm -hmm. land in the country 
uh, for the day, and then the four trains go back to the suburbs. Um, uh, but it, you could certainly do this with like commuter suburbs in London, where I grew up in southeast London. Yeah, the own the only borough of London with no tube stations, and so like if you wanted to do anything in the city that wasn't work, uh, you know, get a fucking night bus back. Uh, exactly. And, like, you know, take yeah. your life in your hands. Because yeah. if you if you want to take the train back home, then you better be ready to like leave whatever you're doing at 9 p.m. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing that really pisses me off. It's like I used to work in King of Prussia. And for those of you who are not familiar, it's 12 miles outside of Philadelphia. And I had to take three incredibly shitty buses on 76. And my commute was what, like an hour and 15 minutes or something? And it was just, and then like getting home, they just stopped running the buses basically. So they were on 45 minute or an hour headways. And it was just like, Okay, I can only take a I can only take a car. This fucking sucks. Like I don't want to do that. The last VRE train out of Washington D.C. Union Station was at six fifty. That's absurd. Oh, that's that's ridiculous. Like, uh, I'm I'm not I'm not hanging out with my friends at the uh, nine thirty club. I can tell you that yeah. much. You're getting fired <laughs> for leaving work too early. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I used to do the reverse commute from London. This is London, UK, not London, Ontario, Canada. Um, to Cambridge, which is Cambridge, UK, not Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. Um, and I used to go the reverse commute, but I could still get a train back at, you know, uh, 1230 AM. Um, now that was the milk run that went to like Hatfield and Stevenage and everything and had every single drunken kid that would go to Cambridge because it was more exciting than where they lived, but you could do it. Um, and you know, at least <laughs> anyway. What I find with this cycling discussion that's so frustrating is that if you look at this, there's so many types of trip that people uh, do on bicycles in the Netherlands. And it's not just about work. Like there's lots of people here, lots of people who will drive to work, but they will still go visit their friends by bicycle. They will do their grocery shopping by bicycle. Uh, they will do everything else by bicycle. It's just the work trip or, you know, if they go on vacation outside of the Netherlands that they'll drive. And, and uh Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's all right. I was just going to say, and that's really lost in the discussion whenever it happens anywhere else. Well, that's a really good point, too, because like now, and I understand that, you know, I'm talking about a specific set of jobs, but like with the professional class moving to, you know, work from home, possibly forever, or at least hybrid like that. I feel like we have to sort of de-emphasize that to a point. Yeah, because like you're right, like people do other shit, not just going to work. Well, I was just working on a, a video, and I actually mentioned this in my Houston video too, that there's this national travel survey in the United States where they look at all car trips. And the average commute, I think it was 16 miles in the United States. But it's something ridiculous, like 45% of all car trips in the United States are four miles or less, or three, yeah. three, mi three miles or less, which is ridiculous. Yep. That's like five kilometers. And that's 45% of all trips. And that's in the US where the cities are designed for driving and the trips are still that short. It's ridiculous. It's bizarre. <laughs> but the thing is, like, you look at it and it's the same thing in, in you know, in my hometown, uh, London, Ontario, which uh, on my channel, I usually call fake London to fake London <laughs> so that it's clear which one I'm talking about because I have lived in both. Um, but in fake London, like there are so many trips that I would take if, if, you know, they may only be one or two kilometers, but walking there sucks and cycling there is a death wish. So, of course, you're going to drive, but it's stupid. That's exactly my experience with getting to Rod. So Roz and I live on opposite sides of Philadelphia now. And like getting there on public transit would be it's it's not that long of a drive, but it's very long on public transit because I just don't happen to be in a transit corridor, and that fucking sucks. Right. Because, like, I want to I get drunk with my pal, but I can't. <laughs> and this is the thing I find in the Netherlands is that, um, the, the, and the, the thing that's really remarkable about the cycling is that cycling infrastructure is literally everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. And, uh, and I'll get into a couple of it in the slides here, but you can go anywhere you want by bicycle. And there's lots of trips that, you won't do by bicycle because public transit will be faster, faster to take the train. It might be faster to drive, whatever. But there's just a ridiculous number. Of you trips. could do it if yes. you wanted if to. If there's any trip you want to, you can do it. 
And so if it's, if it's like five or six kilometers or less, then I'm guaranteed going to cycle it because why wouldn't I? Oh yeah. Um, we should keep moving. (laughs) Yes, we should keep moving. So let's talk about right hooks. Yeah. So this is one of these things where uh, we'll get into it with vehicular cycling, but this is one of the things that people talk about with vehicular cycling is that you're these bike lanes they say are dangerous because as soon as you get to the intersection, you're going to get hit by a car. Fine. So this is, this is the recommendation of how to cycle the vehicular cycling way to avoid Hmm. getting a right hook. A right hook is what you see there. To be the traffic. Right. To be the traffic. A right hook is what you see here on the wrong side here on the left. Uh, Is that this person is in the bike lane. They're going straight through and this driver cuts them off. Right. This is something that happens all the time. So the vehicular cycling recommendation is when there's a car there, you should slow down. Let the car go first. You go to, to the left of the car and you go around it. And this is how you avoid the right hook. Now, admittedly, if the infrastructure sucks, this is good advice. But again, this is like it's putting all of the emphasis here. It's all of the responsibility on the person cycling. Like this driver is just doing driver stuff and you got to do something special to avoid it. So Hmm. something special that makes you act like you're driving a car. Yes. Yes. Except if you were in a car, they wouldn't just smash into you if you're going forward. They would, you know, yield. But mm. anyway. Yeah. So if you go to the next slide, you see how this problem is solved in the Netherlands. Now, this one is a relatively new junction near where I live. Um, and this is a little bit bigger than they typically are because there was lots of room here. But what you have here is a cycle path, a fietspad, if you will, that's about two or three meters wide. And the road is on the left. And what you see here is you're looking straight in. And then the bicycle lane curves to the right at the junction. So there's a junction there where it curves right after that, uh, that big post. And the reason it does that is because if somebody is turning right into that, into that uh, street, they can turn and have their car stop there out of the way of traffic. And they can clearly see anybody cycling. So. This is the sa- done for the same reason, to avoid the right hook. But this is the right hook solved in infrastructure. This is not something that you need instructions on how to do. You know, nobody needs to be taught how to deal with this. You don't have to go through classes. Anybody, and anybody can do it, whether they're 80 years old or whether they're six years old. They can figure this out, right? Mm. And the other thing here to note is that the cycle path continues. It doesn't drop down to the level of the road. This is what called a continuous sidewalk or continuous bike path, the cars go up. So in order to turn right here, you have to go up a little speed bump to the height of the sidewalk, and you have to do a very tight turn, so you have to go quite slowly, and then you have a very clear view of anybody who's coming on a bicycle. And this is right here is the example of how to solve the right hook through infrastructure instead of trying to teach everybody who will ever ride a bicycle some special thing you have to do. Yeah, you you do stuff that like requires people to not think about it. Yes, it's. I I I fucked that up. That (laughs) does not require people to think about it. Not that that, like (laughs) fucking empties your brain, Mm -hmm. and you just like you must achieve a zen state. Yeah, you know the hierarchy of safety controls eliminate the uh, eliminate the problem exactly. Exactly. And yeah, this is- you become like water um, and then merge <laughs> yeah. into the bike lane. <laughs> and this is what they call, uh, I, I don't remember the Dutch for it, but it's basically like self-explaining infrastructure. Like nobody needs to teach you how to do that. It's probably like a self-explaining infrastructure. <laughs> Yeah, well, it is infrastructure, but uh, I see, don't know. <laughs> see how fucking I, 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 I have your number, the Netherlands. <laughs> so anyway, you can move to the next slide. That that's an example where there was awful lot of space to do it mm. properly. Uh, this is from a video um, by Bicycle Dutch. Who anybody who's interested in this should go check out the Bicycle Dutch YouTube channel. Uh, this is called Junction Design, the the cycle friendly way, or something like this. It's a it's a video he's had for like ten years. This is an amazing video because he steps through exactly how to turn a U.S. infrastructure uh, infra, uh, intersection into a Dutch-style intersection. So the top here 
is what they do in the U.S. and Canada all the yes. time. So the bicycle lane is coming in there from from the right. Then you have this like green thing with dotted lines where the cars can cross through. Then you go straight through in between lanes of traffic and then the cars can turn right without right hooking you. But like of a course, formalization of the vehicular cycling method literally it also is. confuses and infuriates everyone. My nemesis is um, <laughs> the intersection at South Street and 33rd. That oh, does yeah. that. And like every single time I'm like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to die. <laughs> yeah. These are brutal when there's a lot of car traffic because you're basically you're forced to cross the car lane and hope that the people turning right will see you. Yeah. Yeah. And, mm. and then the bottom shows the exact same like profile, the same amount of space, but done in a Dutch, typical Dutch, Dutch cycling junction. And basically every major junction in the Netherlands is like this. Like this is not a strange thing. It's not only in a few big cities. This is freaking everywhere. This is standard design code all across the country and has been for decades. So they're everywhere. So here, the bicycle path continues. It continues to be curb protected the entire time. The cyclists go through and they have this island, this little traffic island that I think Roz can circle. He can John Madden it. Yes. There you go. And, uh, and the, as a cyclist, you can turn right here and you never have any interaction with cars at all. If you go straight through, you do. But the cars have to turn on such a steep angle that when they turn, they are it is much easier to see anybody who's cycling. So you just get a better angle of, of, of uh, intersection between the car lane and the bicycle lane. And again, this is such a simple thing, right? Like it's just a different putting curbs and concrete down. Really simple thing to do. Um, but, you know, the top is still being built all over North America, like as if nobody's heard of this Dutch infrastructure that's been around for 30 years. They actually just repaved the one at South Street and 33rd. And the main difference is that they removed the green paint. Uh, oh, that helps. <laughs> that's, Why? Good. that's good. Dude, people from Penn cycled like, oh my God. Like, if even, even, because I think part of this is also, uh, at least partial, the, the, oh, poor people don't cycle bullshit nonsense, but like yes. a ton of people cycle in and out of that specific area because that's where the hospital and all the rich doctors are and they cross yep. the bridge and they want them to die too now apparently mm, uh, and yes. I know we say Pendalenda est uh, mockingly but uh, I would like the doctors to live yeah I think that's a good yeah. idea I can recommend that <laughs> so um, the, this bottom thing the, the one thing you'll see sometimes in North America these protected intersections are starting to pop up in various places um, in the US and in Canada. Uh, however, they're almost like cargo cult infrastructure. They kind of look like this, but they don't act like this. And there's actually a lot of details that's not worth getting into here about where the stop line is and, and the signals timing. So like there'll be bicycle lights that go green first for cyclists so that they get ahead of cars. And there's, there's all these, these details. There's actually a really good website called protectedintersection.com that a guy in the US has put together about how to do this properly and he's got every little detail that should be done in order to build these properly but anyway it, there are a bunch of details but this really is a simple simple concept and it doesn't take up any more space than a typical intersection does like they put them here literally everywhere even in strange shaped intersections you'll see this this uh concrete island um it's all over the place and it just makes such a huge difference hmm Hmm. And we can see this done wrong on the next slide. Oh, good. Yep. I love bike gore. Yes. <laughs> this is terrible. Yeah. So this first picture it, on the left here was taken by an urban planner in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, which is where I went to university, University of Waterloo. Um, uh, this is Northfield Drive there for anybody interested in swinging by to see this horror show. This is insane. Like this is a highway on ramp and they've just done this green strip of paint right through the center of it. Um, right. And if you look of far course. in the distance, you can see that there's like a semi tractor trailer coming through here. Like this isn't in literally insane. And it's, it's, it's the same kind of like 
theoretical support is painting like a rainbow flag or Black Lives we Matter on the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We, we just don't we, give we a are fuck. Aware. It, It's yeah, like, exactly. this, this isn't cycling infrastructure, this is cycling awareness. Yeah. <sighs> You should, uh, you, you have access to cycling. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, this is the, uh, this is the whole, you know, we built all these bike lanes and nobody uses them. I guess we shouldn't be building bike lanes. Yeah. You, you, you sort of, uh, you like, you, 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 you build it to check the box. You don't build it to work. <laughs> right. <laughs> we did that. Stop fucking showing up to the planning meetings. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> so this was put in place about three years ago and immediately it was everybody who rides a bike was like you've got to be fucking kidding me and it was in the news and it was a big deal and and this tweet went viral and they've done absolutely nothing about this in the last three years it's still exactly the same and stuff like this is still being built all the time yeah and the, the one on the right here is in florida um you know florida is the flattest state in the united states it has pretty good weather most of the time and nobody rides a bicycle there and it's entirely because of well you're looking this shit yeah yes this mm. shit exactly also it's much more comfortable to bike in higher temperatures than it is to walk just because you get the air on your face yeah, so even exactly when it's, you know like 95 degrees out in florida 100 percent humidity you at least got the air streaming on your face yeah. you feel a lot better and, and you yet, can get an e-bike and you can or you can <laughs> just ride slower and like enjoy the the breeze yeah this is <sighs> I, there's every every single time I get some jackass coming on my channel and saying, "Wow, well, the only reason they cycle in the Netherlands is because it's flat." I'm like, "Florida's just as flat as the Netherlands is." Um, or sometimes people will say, "Because you have good weather there," and they've obviously never been to the Netherlands because the weather is <laughs> shit here. Yeah, like I thought the weather was bad when I lived in the UK. It is absolute garbage here. It is <laughs> and you got and you, you got these sorts of treatments. These sorts of treatments that like especially exits uh completely ruin a cycling experience. Like I there there's uh there's a, a a section like this in Philly at the University Avenue bridge and as a result it's completely unusable for cyclists. No one can go there right. unless they have, you know, some kind of death wish. Um <laughs> Nothing yeah, I mean, ruins I a think cycling this, experience like death. Yeah, yes. th I think this Surprisingly, is but... we've we've discovered the fifth type of cyclist. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I get people also when I talk about this stuff, and uh, I can't believe I've gotten myself talking in, about this stuff because I hate talking about this stuff. But apparently, I've made myself a YouTube channel about it. So let's talk about highways here so that i get people saying that well you know we got to have highways how are we going to get cyclists to go down the highway and here is a highway junction on the left here in rotterdam which is pretty car friendly city as far as dutch cities go because it was leveled in um world war ii and then they said let's build back like the american like uh, when you read oh, back you through stuff idiots. like this, <laughs> when, when you read back from like the 40s, 50s and 60s in the Netherlands, they they just really wanted to do the American car thing. They thought that was just the best shit around. And there's so much stuff that was directly impacted by what was happening in America. They even brought American traffic planners over. I made this video about this plan, Jokinen, which was literally like, let's just pave highways through every single city. And it's Dutch yeah. for planning to become the Joker. <laughs> <laughs> so this here Pays is a earth. huge highway junction in Rotterdam. And if you look at that little green line, that's the way the cyclists go through it. So, and, and you can see here on the right, this is what it looks like from the highway. The cyclists just stay at ground level. It doesn't change up, doesn't go down. You don't have to do any grade changes at all. You just cycle the fastest and most direct route kind of i mean you kind of have to go around that one clover leaf but this is the way it is and then all of the highways are built over it so this is the way that you get people on bikes through a highway interchange not by putting them right next to the highway exit mm. you know I'm, I'm i'm gonna i'm gonna say this uh, i i bet i'm i'm gonna hazard a guess that probably this bike lane this bikeway here has a higher throughput of people than the entire freeway interchange. <laughs> <laughs> that is entirely possible. <laughs> yeah. So we can move on to uh, the next one here, which this, 
takes a little bit of explaining. So you can see that the, the general Dutch method of cycling is to keep cyclists separated from cars, like as separated as possible. So we saw that they have separated bicycle paths. They have protected intersections where they're separated. They have the totally grade separated crossings at those highway interchanges. And this is another way that they separate car and bicycle traffic. So this is, um, uh, this is a great Dutch word. This is the Dutch concept of onflechten, uh -huh. which uh -huh. kind of means like disentangling. So the way they do the traffic engineering in Dutch cities is they have specific routes that people in cars are meant to take. And then they have other routes that people in bicycles are meant to take. And they do this on purpose. So there are maps available um, online that will show you, you know, which way you should go on a bicycle, which way you should go on a car. But normally you don't have to think about it much because the bicycle route is the, is the quickest and most direct route. So this one on the left, starting from the bottom, this is like a real bicycle ride I did once. You go out, you turn left, you go straight up, you get to where you're going. Um, you can't do this in a car. Uh, you can't do this route in a car because there are several sections in here where they have what are called modal filters, where there is a do not enter sign or there's a curb or there's something Bollards, that prevents yeah, you from going yeah. through, bollards, sure, um, that prevents you from going through with an automobile. So the, the cars are meant to take uh, a what's called a hofnet, um, and they will turn God right. God damn it, dude. Exactly. <laughs> I know. There's a lot of Dutch here, all right? It's, it's a Dutch thing. Deal with it. So <laughs> if you're driving this same route in a car, you have to turn right and go around. And you can see that this route here on the left is longer for the car than it is for the bicycle. Um, but this is the way that they keep car traffic from going absolutely everywhere, because Certainly everywhere in Canada, cars can basically go everywhere. Like every street can have a car down it and you can drive anywhere you want. And when you're on a bicycle, you have to take those same routes. But here, the routes that a car will take and a routes that a bike will take are totally different. The one on the right is another example. So here is going from Amsterdam Zoud, south to Amsterdam Nord, north. And on a bicycle, you take the direct route through the center of the city. You take a ferry and you get there in a much shorter distance than if you take a car. Now, a car would take the highway, which is a better way to go in a car. But again, that, that blue route would not be possible in a car. It would not be physically possible to do. And that's on purpose. And this is exactly one of these ways that by doing this, it means that when you're cycling, not only are you have protected bicycle infrastructure, but even if you don't, there are very few cars around. Because the only cars you're going to run into will be local traffic for those destinations. Like there will be no through traffic at all. So not only are you usually separated from cars, even when you're not, the traffic is so light that it's okay that you're not separated from cars. And this is the ultimate separation that you're never going to be, have a problem with a car because you hardly ever interact with cars at all when you're on a bicycle. I know it's fucking mind blowing. Yeah, I know it, it's it, it's just uh, it's a more civilized way to do it. Uh, keep them yeah, separated by yeah. the offspring just yeah, all the time. Uh, and it's 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 not subtle either. It's yeah. like it's a less nudge theory and more like fucking shove theory. But I yeah, really yes. appreciate it. Oh, well, I think that yeah. probably is the only way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is the only way to do it because the uh, and I I've talked about this in in previous videos that I've made. The thing was, it didn't used to be like this, and like. It was shown in a few slides ago near near the beginning that street was totally full of cars and of course it was because if you can drive why wouldn't you you might look out and say oh geez it might rain on my way home maybe i should just take the car right but if you look at this and you think you know what it's going to be faster if i just bike and it's easier to park i'm just going to bike it and that is exactly the thought process that so many people make in the netherlands because of stuff like this and it's all done on purpose and Next that's, slide, please. That's why, you know, in in, in Netherlands, uh, bikes for everyone, right? You know, the the men ride bikes, the women ride bikes, people of undetermined gender ride bikes, <laughs> kids ride bikes, rich people ride bikes, poor people ride yeah. bikes. Young it is crazy people. when you see like like ninety year olds riding bicycles. Thin people ride bikes, fat people ride bikes, <laughs> white people ride bikes, black people ride bikes. A lot more near Christmas. Um, <laughs> 
Sorry. <laughs> Take me a second, dude. Jesus Christ. I was just <laughs> waiting for that joke. Yeah. I was literally just like, it's okay, like you really, gonna... really slipped that one in. Yeah. We're going to get like, this I know, to I, know, I know I'm tired, but like, God, that took me a minute. Yes, um, um, <laughs> uh, I don't even have the excuse to be tired. I'm just dumb, apparently. <laughs> Tragic. Uh, I, I really it's, can't it's a believe harmless that. Christmas tradition. <sighs> Another fun one is even disabled people can ride bikes over there because yeah. you know those, that's actually those, a really good point. Those specialized bikes is, are are they're expensive though, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> yeah, they are. Um, there's a lot of alternatives though. Um, yeah. The you can get tricycles that are significantly cheaper. You don't have to have a hand bike, um, but it is interesting. I see disabled people in the bicycle lanes every single day uh, that I'm out like, every single day. Um, there are lots of people who use these bicycle paths for uh, mobility scooters. That's like super common as well. They That's have- the thing that always scares the shit out of me in North Philly is that like, we have a ton of people like around, around my neighborhood where they're just, they, they are forced to ride the mobility scooters in the road and then people blow by what? them. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Sidewalks are very suck. bad here in yeah, Philly. The, yeah. Um, they just don't bother to maintain them. And they're like, wow, I can't believe that that person died. It's like, really? Can't fucking believe it. I, well, because we have a system where the sidewalk is the responsibility of the adjacent property owner. So, um, right. you know, if you have a unmaintained vacant lot, of which there are many in North Philly. There's no yeah. sidewalk there, As so the out, mobility yes. chair doesn't work so well on you know just dirt. Um, <laughs> that is the when, absolute worst when the adjacent so property owner is responsible so for cruel. the it's sidewalk. Terrible. It is cruel. It's ridiculous. Like how is that not the responsibility of the city? I just fuck. I don't know. That, that is uh, that is an interesting thing about bike lanes is uh, pretty much every uh, everywhere they do also sort of double as infrastructure for people who use mobility chairs or things like yeah, that. Yeah, they do. Now, um, another, another group of people who ride bikes are Lycra guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, now, and for a while, at least here in the States, they had a monopoly on it. You know, they actually have a different word in Dutch for like a, a racing cyclist and a, a regular cyclist. They don't really? use the word. Yeah. So the, like a they regular don't use the person, like a guy. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, they don't say mammals. Um, the <laughs> middle-aged men in lycra. For anybody new to that term, ah. um, the uh, the the term for a general cyclist is a feetser, Um, and that's like just somebody on a bicycle. And the the term for somebody who's like racing cyclist is called a wheel runner, which literally means wheel runner. Hmm. Um, and and there's this very clear distinction between them. And actually, there's sometimes like the way that people hate cyclists in the U.S. Some people have issues with wheel runners. They say they ride too fast and all this kind of thing. But, uh, you know, there still has to be that prejudice. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's interesting that they have those two different words for it because it's very clear which ones you're talking about. You build the infrastructure for the features. And, and that's where we're going to go right now mm. to... Davis, California in 1964. A fantastic um, place and time. The Feetzers. Yes. Look at that Feetzer. That is a, that's a Feetzer right there. If I've um, ever seen one. So University of California, Davis had a really big campus, right? They still have a really big campus. Um, it's California, so the weather's nice all year round, except when it's on fire. But Davis is <laughs> far enough away from the fires that it's fine. Um, you know, and the best way to get around on campus was on a bike, right? And even in 1966 this was obvious but if you lived off campus uh it was difficult to bike off campus there was more traffic in the city of davis um there was you know it, it was it, it started to become difficult um but bicycle traffic itself was also a problem during periods between classes at uc davis the students would all almost simultaneously get on their bikes and bike to another location on campus and that meant intersections in 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 the uh, campus and the surrounding town could be blocked with as many as two hundred bicycles a minute. Jesus, yeah. um, I mean, there are rules, yeah. but that's you you couldn't do that with cars. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, also, in the sixties, you started to get the the first uh, like really high quality mass market bikes. Right, we're talking. We're going to. Instead of like one speeds, now you got a ten speed. It's got a nice steel frame. It's 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 comfortable to ride on. It's fairly right, lightweight. 
um, these things are just really starting to come to market, right? Mm. Um, so Frank and Eve Child were a couple who had returned from vacation in the Netherlands in my mouse is not working 1964 um and they saw some of the concepts of separated bike lanes demonstrated there right and they thought they made sense and those were still quite new here at the at the time oh Um, yeah that yeah that was like a very new concept they were just trialing all of the dutch people are like we want to be american we want to drive big cars like you and then Mm -hmm. these two americans Mm -hmm. are like no the opposite of that yeah um so they thought these these made sense for the city of Davis, and they formed sort of the small group of advocates. They presented their idea. They presented their ideas to city council, and they blew them off. Right, da- Davis mm. has too many bikes as it is. Separate lanes would solve nothing. And anyway, accidents occurred, intersections mostly. So what would separate lanes do? Right. Um. And their little advocacy group, they call it the Citizens Bicycle Safety Committee you know, quietly but diligently sort of gathered signatures on a petition, right? They sort of, the city council is providing illogical counter arguments to their policies, which is what city councils do. But mostly yep. they sort of built built up a coalition, right, mm-hmm. to try and get this infrastructure installed. The city council wouldn't budge. So in 66, they sponsored their own slate of city council candidates. And it turned out that people wanted something done about the bike traffic. And uh, they won with their slate overwhelmingly. <laughs> nice. Yeah. B- yeah. Bike bi- bi- Republic. Them. Yes. So at this point, there's no standard for bike lanes anywhere in the United States, right? Uh, in fact, depending on who you ask, they were probably explicitly illegal. Um, Fuck it with a can't take a joke, Ross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in Davis, they sort of experiment with several types of bicycle lane. Uh, to pretty great success, um, you know, and 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 these proved so popular and so useful that by 1972, the whole town was connected with some form of cycling facility, right? I this- love that they were trialing this stuff in the 1960s. They were trying out different things, and now today in the 2020s, we still have cities trialing things and trying them out, and let's see if yeah. this works. And I'm like, come on, Ask guys. Ask us about Washington mm. Avenue. Yeah, it's about this. Oh my it's god. It's like all of this stuff has been done by now. There's already, like research studies need, done. Need, need, need more consultations. Oh, oh we'll, we'll get to how that happened. Um, <laughs> you know, Davis, California had a very strong bike policy through like the 70s and 80s. They'd separate bike paths they had bike only streets design codes that required greenways and any new housing development stuff like that um through the 70s and 80s davis california had a bicycle mode share of around 24 percent which was Sam. comparable or even exceeding the netherlands at the time it probably right? was in the in yeah. the 60s mode share is percentage of trips by any given type of transportation um and you know this is before things like cargo bikes that made like trips to the grocery store very easy. Um, We're back to grocery stores again. Yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Ask you about wise markets. He shouts (laughs) as he's carried away from the podcast. Um, (laughs) Now this is a bit of a digression, but you know, in the nineties, the engineers into into digression on this podcast, my God, in the nineties, the engineers who had designed and built all these excellent bike facilities started to retire they had all been avid bike riders themselves, you know, the design bike infrastructure they'd want to use. Um, you know, the standards reflected this, but the successors were not so enthusiastic. Uh, Davis has since been sort of inconsistent with bike infrastructure and a bunch of NIMBYs began fighting to sever some of the bike greenways so they don't have to see poor people. Right. You know, <laughs> so that, that, you know, our planning is fucked up in this country, but Success in Davis led to a broader movement to standardize and formalize designs for bike infrastructure in California and later in the United States as a whole. Um, And this is going to be important here. This is a street called Sycamore Street, which has since been redesigned with a worse bike lane configuration. That's Um, nice. Yeah. Uh, This this is a parking separated bike lane, right? So you got you got the bike lane, and then there's a line of parked cars. And that prevent, protects you from getting hit by the moving cars, right? Hmm. Um, this is one of their original experimental designs. Uh, they came up with a few. 
um, and they decided the best one was to have the bike lane on the other side of the parking next to traffic because of reasons. Genius level <laughs> shit. Yes. Wow. But um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to how that happened, I think, in the next slide or maybe the slide afterwards. But Davis's experiments sort of uh, spawned more interest in how do we develop standard cycleways for hmm. California and for maybe the entire United States afterwards. Yeah, what if you just get your cycle infrastructure out of a book, you implement it, you do it, and then yeah. you just, you know, then it's done. Yeah, what's crazy you, talk? What if you just had a book you could look in to show you what the right answer was? Yeah, it's this called is, the Quran. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it's actually called the Crow Manual. Yeah, <laughs> close enough. Close enough. Yeah. Of course, you really got to get into the hadith for the like real deep shit. But That's where all the good stuff say, is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there's been a hadith on bicycle infrastructure. Not to the best of my knowledge. We can hit yeah. up a cleric. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's time. What are the standards for bicycle infrastructure in Iran? Hmm. What are the standards of bicycle infrastructure in Mecca? Can no. I do tawaf no. on a bicycle? Oh, oh the Saudis no. don't no. want you riding a bike. No, the Saudis, yeah, no. <laughs> Hi, it's Justin. Uh, so this is a commercial for the podcast that you're already listening to. Uh, people are annoyed by these, so let me get to the point. We have this thing called Patreon, right? The deal is you give us two bucks a month and we give you an extra episode once a month. Uh, sometimes it's a little inconsistent, but you know, it's two bucks. You get what you pay for. Um, it also gets you our full back catalog of bonus episodes so you can learn about exciting topics like guns, pickup trucks, or pickup trucks with guns on them. The money we raise through Patreon goes to making sure that the only ad you hear on this podcast is this one. Anyway, that's something to consider if you have two bucks to spare each month. Uh, join at patreon.com forward slash WTYP pod. Do it if you want. Or don't. It's your decision, and we respect that. Back to the show. UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, was ordered by the state legislature to research bikeway construction standards. And the resulting document was called Bikeway Planning Criteria and Guidelines. It was very ahead of its time, and it was almost completely correct. Um, I only had time to skim through it, but, you know, you can see, like, these sort of Dutch-style intersections um, that were sort of the recommended treatments pretty much everywhere, right? And um, this is the U.S. in 1972. Yes. And now we still see shit all the time where some traffic engineer comes up with something like this, and they're like, look what I just invented. I'm like, <laughs> Jesus Christ, guys. No, no. It's, it's something that keeps being like reinvented because the, like the nobody ever grasps that the reason why it isn't done is political rather than like yes. in, infrastructural, right? There's a uh, huge I think that problem is... with history in the civil engineering profession. I think, yeah, no one knows what happened. That people got like goldfish memories. Um, mm. History is not taught. Uh, history is not something you're supposed to think about. You know, if you come up with this brand new idea that came up, it was actually from 1972. It's, it happens constantly. <laughs> um, There's never been a vacuum train. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so this generally recommended protected bikeways adjacent to streets. They provide designs with extra safety and intersections. They crib deliberately from uh, developing design guidelines in the Netherlands. Right. Um, there was a further study which we'll reference later, that was critiqued the Davis bike system that recommended some improvements to certain areas that they thought had been insufficiently designed, like Sycamore Street we talked about before. You know, some of the sight lines were bad. Um, people parked too close to intersections. There were a little more crashes than you would expect. Um, the lane was designed for one-way traffic, but actually had two-way traffic, uh, mm. which they thought was a problem because it was too wide, apparently. Um, and also, no one cleared debris out of it. Um, 
which you would think would be a problem you would solve by clearing debris out of it rather than changing the design. But what do I know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, this uh, this issue of the the parking protected bike lane, like in that previous slide, is is actually pretty good. But one of the issues comes up with the sight lines at intersections. But it's not that freaking hard. You put a curb there so that nobody can park close to the intersection. It's yeah. really not that difficult. But and I, I for some reason, <laughs> make, make this like out to be this this incompatible thing. I'm like, yeah. come on, guys. Pour some in, concrete. Intractable prop. Yeah, put a curb in. It's, it's you know, I, I mean, a curb is a project that takes a little longer than paint, but it's not like impossible. But curbs do exist. Um, <laughs> yeah, but now we've invented flexi posts. And so, you know, oh, curbs God. are obsolete. Oh my God. Well, you know, they, they, they last a good, you know, two and a half weeks after you install them. Um, <laughs> I did see something in uh, guerrilla urbanism where you should just replace flexi posts at random with, uh, bollards. <laughs> yeah, that would be a great idea. I'm sold on that. Let's do it. <laughs> um, I'll get the drill. The result of the study was the city of Davis eventually swapped the location of the parking lane and the bike lane rather than trying to fix the problems. Um, <laughs> of course. And they, they probably did it because they needed to take away like three parking spots. Uh, uh, they took away a lot of parking for the initial system. I will say that. They, um, All right, fair enough. Yeah, they had... They, uh, then they, what did they do? Uh, well, you know, they, they, we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> now, this study it was a UCLA study. Um, the design document, I mean, was a UCLA thing, and it was not official policy of the California Department of Transportation. It was not widely accepted by tra traffic engineers at the time, but, you know, it's a good start. Um, in the meantime, other cities in California went ahead with their own bikeway schemes, and they had varying degrees of quality, one of which was the root of all evil in this world, Palo Alto. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> My, uh, yeah, when I uh, I worked for a company that was headquartered in Palo Alto. Oh, which one? Well, it was called Display Link. <laughs> you wouldn't know it, but uh, yes, every tech company ever. Mm -hmm. um, I actually I lived in the Bay Area for for a short while, um, but then I also when I was living in the UK, I was working for a company based out of out of Palo Alto, and I would have to go down there sometimes. Like, God damn it, I hate that place. <laughs> <laughs> so. Palo Alto has always been a rich town. Um, you know, it's like Except for East Palo Alto. Hmm. Is that the part like near the university? Wait, East. No, I'm thinking East. Oh, okay. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I, I'm confused. I don't anyway. know the geography of Palo Alto. Yeah. Um, forget Palo Alto. Just yeah, let, let's exactly. pretend it doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. Um, Happy hour. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's adjacent <laughs> to Stanford University. Has good weather. It's, Flat-ish. You Hoover blowing fucks. You'd think they'd have the money to build out a high-quality bike network on the scale of Davis's, but instead they tried to cheap out, right? So Palo Alto's bicycle network, that's in air quotes, um, was a few painted lanes, but mostly designated side paths. And those side paths were just sidewalks. They, they were just mm. the existing sidewalks. Right. Um, and, Innovative. Yes. And the city passed an ordinance to legally require cyclists to ride on the sidewalk instead of in the roadway. Hmm. And that, that meant you were going pretty slow because these are narrow four foot uh, sidewalks. Palo Alto is a town with houses, with garages mostly. So there's drivers backing out. You know, you can, you, you, you it's not. It's not an ideal circumstance for cycling when you're forced onto a narrow sidewalk that it, it has lots of changes in grade. You can't go fast. You got to go real slow, which uh, piqued the attention of our guy. Hmm. The subject of this episode, a mere hour <laughs> in. Hour and 30 <laughs> minutes in. John Forrester. Ah, uh, boo! <laughs> Inventor of the Subaru Forester. Yes. <laughs> So he's born October 7th, 1929. His father was English novelist C.S. Forrester. Um, Not familiar. He thought that might be, but was, no. uh, the, He wrote like a series of uh, books about uh, some guy in the Navy, I want to say. Oh, um, the Hornblower novel? Yes. Oh, uh, okay. Also mentored a Roald Dahl. 
Um, Roll mm-hmm. Dahl hates the Jews. Hated the Jews. <laughs> that, that, that too, yeah. <laughs> um, he took up cycling at a very early age. He, was one of, he lived in London. Uh, he, he was one of the only kids who biked to his school. Um, he was a great fan of the British Cyclist Touring Club, but I'd be probably far too young to join because his family moved to Berkeley, California in 1940 to get away from the Blitz. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and he, ascended, he attended UC Berkeley. He uh, studied industrial engineering, um, which is sort of like layouts of factories, mostly. Um, Preserve of the utterly deranged. Yes. yes. Um, I don't think they, when I went, I, they didn't even offer it as a major anymore. Uh, when I went to Drexel, um, mm-hmm. they had a lot of weird or, engineering or where I went. offers it as a grad one. program. Uh, so he, you know, he became an American citizen in 1951. He was an amateur bike racing guy. He was in the Navy for a bit in Korea. Um, but he eventually settled in Berkeley, you know, and this is back, this is back when Berkeley was cheap. Um, and he was, uh, he was still biking. He was biking on roads, in traffic, with the very small minority of people who did so at this time, who were mostly, you know, young, fit men of unlimited physical courage, right? Ross. Yes. Hmm. hmm. Um, and he gets into sort of the bicycle advocacy game when there was a set of regulations on bicycle construction proposed in 1972, right? And this was... I don't remember what the, the agency was. If it was the Consumer Product Safety something or other. Uh, but they, uh, the, the main... people who stop you like uh, throwing lawn darts into yeah, your kids' eyes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. This is, it was intended to prevent defective or unsafe children's bikes from being manufactured or sold. But because legislators were unaware that adults rode bikes, it applied to all bikes. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Um and that's stupid country, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> we are Christ god. almighty. Oh, we put a man on the moon not that long ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, man. So that's so <laughs> I hate it here. Go on. There, there were a lot that's of why per- I left. There, there were a lot of particulars here which I didn't fully understand. Um, there was stuff about like uh, the 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 handlebars having to have a certain shape. There was stuff about reflectors that would have basically made it impossible to mount a headlight on your bike, um, you know. But uh, also, the pedals had to be able to fall off for some reason. I didn't understand that. <laughs> That's, That's a Wait, good idea. Saving. Yeah. It's always what I want when I'm cycling. Yeah. I love I love the government so much. Fuck and this all comics. this made them all. Um, what uh, Forrester called them toy bikes. That's a, that's a phrase we're going to come back to at some point. Um, now, Forrester, to his credit, he took the case to a court which didn't have jurisdiction over the regulations and acted as, own, as, acted as his own lawyer. Fool for a client. And got <laughs> most of the regulatory package overturned anyway. Huh? Oh, Damn! Yeah, not bad, right? John. I love I, this country. Man. Le- legal genius. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he's still very suspicious of any separated bike infrastructure, right? And I think rightfully so in the case of Palo Alto. And this is where he starts to embark on a campaign of stunts. Oh, no. oh we lo- we love a campaign of stunts. Yeah. Is this going to be like the John three sixteen guy who died in that shootout with police or whatever? What? You you ever see from sports events from like the eighties or nineties? I no, I know guy, about the John three sixteen guy. Yeah, D- he D- he was I died in a either a shoot off a shootout or a standoff with police. One of the two. I mean, the, yeah. there's some overlap there. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> this is from this is from the man himself on his website, which can now only be accessed through the Wayback Machine. Um, <laughs> You well, had to be a real crank to have a website at this point. Oh my god, it was, um, it, it, it's... Thanks. So, while cycling to work, I bumped into the early stage of this program at Palo Alto. My route took me along Middlefield Road, the intermediate north-south route between the two major routes. One day I saw new signs, similar to parking regulation signs, saying that bicycles must use the sidewalk. 
I knew that English cyclists had beaten such regulations in the 30s, so I refused. After some days, the police came Am along. Am I being detained? <laughs> <laughs> After some, I know my rats. I know my rats. Also, he's, he didn't die in a standoff with police. He was convicted of multiple kidnapping charges following an incident in 1992 and is now serving three life sentences in Mule Creek State Prison. I beg your pardon? <laughs> yeah, he apparently believed the rapture was coming in six days and like kidnapped a maid and two guys. Uh, what? what? All right, all right, go, okay. go on. After <laughs> some days, the police came alongside and, I instruct, and, and they instructed me nicely to use the sidewalk. I refused until they charged me <laughs> with violating a municipal ordinance. Uh, you can tell this was written before the adoption of tasers. Yeah. <laughs> when I read the ordinance, it also required cyclists on streets with bike lanes painted to turn left from the curb lane, right? Uh, so, you know, turn left across traffic. That uh, seems like suicide. So hmm. I, I went around to find a police car where there was a bike lane and turned left from the center of the roadway. Then I had two tickets that ordered me to violate the standard rules of the road. <laughs> I, you just, I, I, I hate that an essential function of society, at like as sort of an outlet valve, is cranks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I agree with what I, he's doing here, I mean, actually. Yeah, the thing yeah. is, he, <laughs> this is why John Forrester is actually more interesting than you'd think, because they, uh, there's a lot of stuff he does that you're kind of like, yeah, okay, dude, like, yeah. nicely done. Yeah, that is bullshit. Yeah. So, hmm? bravo, John. So, there was a real trial, not a traffic court hearing, in which I prepared diagrams showing why movements in accordance with the standard rules of the road were reasonably safe and within human ability. My other diagram showed why the movements ordered by the ordinance produced more car-bike collision conflicts and required abilities that humans did not have, like eyes in the back of the head. <laughs> we could regulate that. <laughs> could regulate that. You know tigers have spots on the backs of their heads? That's the, the false eyes. That's the one that always freaks me out, because what, what the fuck is a tiger afraid of? Well, uh, I mean, <laughs> well, now you got me thinking about that. I mean, the th the full side that always freaks me out is orcas. You know, are orcas apex predators? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but they have full size. I don't like it. Nature scares me a lot. If that wasn't <laughs> obvious, <laughs> I was, stay home. I was convicted just the same, but when the conviction was settled, the city repealed its ordinance. The city, re city council realized how it had ordered cyclists to endanger themselves and did not like that liability. Hmm. My dad won a case in, in uh, federal court doing that once. Um, so that's, that's the himself, official, or? like, well, no, there's no. your problem, like, um, uh, advice, is be your own lawyer. It always works. <laughs> yes, it always works. Every, every single time. time. Every single well, every time. time. But, but he, he lost, right? But they did yeah. it anyway. But so. the, yeah, he still got the ordinance overturned. Now, right. many people, this is the second stunt. Many people, including cyclists, told me that I had greatly exaggerated the dangers produced by these bike lays and their law. I finally decided to test that theory. I rode the middle field sidewalk at the same speed that I had regularly been using on the roadway. Keep in mind, he's a very strong cycler. He's probably going 25 miles an hour yeah. <laughs> on this four foot sidewalk. <laughs> I figured that with my foreknowledge of the dangers and my bike handling skills, I would survive. I was threatened by collision situations that I figured most cyclists would not escape. Uh, several times per mile. Then I rode the sidewalk of Oregon, which had four lanes at 35 miles an hour. Okay, I guess he's a little faster than I thought. Damn, that's fast. <laughs> you just look around, this guy's fucking, like, speed cycling at you. I become one with the Lycra. The Lycra becomes like Venom and Spider-Man, really. Yeah, this, man, this man has the symbiote, but it's yeah. Lycra, yeah. I think there were some 1970s cars that wouldn't have gone 35 miles per hour. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Roz's dad, Chevy Nova. <laughs> Intending to turn left, I looked ahead and there was a platoon of cars a long way away. I looked behind and there was another platoon of cars a long way away. So from the sidewalk, I turned left across the roadway. 
I had missed that platoon of cars coming from behind me. Or I had missed that the platoon of cars coming from behind me had a lead car in the number one lane far ahead of the others, and I was cycling directly into its path. Oh, the safety car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was leaning for the left turn and could not turn right away from that car, but I could tighten the turn to ride toward that car on the lane line between the two cars. I'm a little confused at what's happening here. He, he's 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 Kobayashi Maruing this shit. Oh, he's yeah. turning into the path <laughs> of the torpedo. <laughs> the two lanes of cars passed by me on each side. I got to the center line, waited for the platoon to come to the, uh, the other way to overtake me, and rode to the curb, where I sat down to think things over. <laughs> Covered in my own piss. <laughs> <laughs> and he probably, you know, was not wearing a helmet or anything, and he no. was on a 70s racing bike, and Jesus, that was yeah. uh, that's a close call. Yeah. Quite clearly, these facilities and laws were at least as dangerous as I had initially figured, and maybe more so. My middle field ride was done at normal road cycling speed. The Oregon left turn from a sidewalk down a sidewalk ramp was done at walking speed. Bikeway advocates have loudly criticized my middle field ride because I was cycling dangerously fast. They don't realize that their criticism condemns their ideology. The facility- I, I, I love to deploy a sentence like they don't realize that their criticism... Like, th- this, that is this, is, this is a fantastic guy you've discovered. <laughs> imagine, imagine him on Twitter. Oh, oh my god. god. He'd yeah. be fucking great on Twitter. <laughs> oh, no, it would all be Substack rants. Their criticism condemns their ideology. Their facility was extremely dangerous when used at the speed that had always been safe on the roadway. 35 not, miles per hour on a bike. Jesus I'm, Christ. I'm not sure it does condemn their ideology, but I do kind of respect this man. Yeah. No, I, 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 I mean... I agree with a lot of his criticisms, but I don't agree with his conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> the type of shit liberals say about Marx. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Forrester wrote about his stunts in a local cycling enthusiast journal. A lot of people thought he was crazy, but a lot more people thought he was onto something, and he started to develop the philosophy of vehicular cycling, right? Here's some people cycling vehicularly, right? You are the traffic. Yes. Act like the traffic. Pretend you're a car. <sighs> the philosophy of vehicular cycling is that cyclists fare best when they act and are treated as drivers of vehicles. Right? He publishes a book called Effective Cycling in 1976, which is also the title of Forrester's education program. And he started up at the same time with, I believe, the League of American Wheelmen. Um, Hell of a cool name. name. That's a cool yeah, name. That, that is a pretty cool name. <laughs> Um, but yeah, your, your cyclist is supposed to assertively use the road in exactly the way a motor vehicle would. You know, if you got a left turn lane and it's four lanes over, uh, you better cut across traffic and use it. You fucking nerd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's actually what it says in the manual, crazily enough. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, there is an invisible car shaped box around your bicycle yes. and you better fucking act like it. Honest. And then I you, went home and fucked your father's <laughs> wife. <laughs> so, um, he had, he had some interesting concepts he put forward, like the motorist's superiority phobia, right? Which I. Uh, <laughs> So motorists in the motor industry God loves words. <laughs> he loves to like you know you know you're like getting into crank territory when you try to like psychoanalyze this shit. Like oh yep. yes. uh, this guy who cut me off in traffic, he's not just an asshole. He he's exhibiting clinically, a su- he's an asshole. Clinically, yeah. this man is exhibiting a, a superiority phobia. Well, the motorist mm-hmm. superiority phobia is that motorists in the motor industry are engaged in a plot to prevent cyclists from using the roadway by shoving them onto sidewalks, side paths, or dedicated lanes, right? Oh, that's, that's like that's, only that's... 70% true. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe 80. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, then there was the cyclist inferiority phobia. Oh. Yeah. 
So most cyclists are are sort of taking the lane. (laughs) If you don't cycle 35 miles an hour straight down the middle of the lane, you are a fucking pussy and you need to get on my level. (laughs) You, John. Yeah, I I guess this is is, uh, the core of the philosophy of vehicular cycling is... Is everyone's a pussy but me? (laughs) You are are bitch made, use the whole lane and go, go as fast as a car. Today we just call that ableist. <laughs> if your calves don't look like fucking two cantaloupes yeah. in a sack, <laughs> you have no business riding this bicycle. The core of the philosophy is get good. <laughs> no, I still get, I still get fuckers commenting on my YouTube channel who were say things like, "Well, if you can't handle it, you shouldn't be out there on a bike." And I'm just like, "Go yeah, fuck yourself." Honestly, no one says that about driving a car. Except for mm-hmm. me. Yeah, except for you. That's, so, <laughs> you know, I, listen, on, on highways, I am... You become you a know, different, worse yeah, person. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Evil I'll Liam just, has now just, taken the wheel. <laughs> I abandoned all morality. I'm just, I'm mowing through orphanages. I'm playing life like it's, uh, like it's a Grand Theft Auto game. <laughs> So you're you're the strong and fearless category, but in a car. Yeah, yeah well, it's a two ton metal box. <laughs> so the cyclist inferior phobia, um, inferiority phobia, excuse me, is that most cyclists, you know, they're afraid of taking the lane, as we now call it, because most people's cycling education happened in childhood, and that was primarily designed to keep them from being run over. Right. Um, that's a good idea, by the way. To yes. not get run over. Uh, uh, mm. Forrester said, the problem is that people have been taught to fear cycling in the vehicular manner. They have been t- taught that obeying the traffic laws on a bicycle will kill them. They've been taught physics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your, your problem is that you were taught how to ride a bicycle by someone who cared about you and didn't want you to die, <laughs> instead of being put <laughs> into a sort of Spartan agoge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm here to remind you that your life is worthless, and unless you are cycling at 35 miles an hour, you might as well commit sepico. <laughs> to, to become a vehicular cyclist, you must first kill a cyclist in a bike lane. <laughs> kill the cyclist inside your head. <laughs> yeah, you earn your red light quick. <laughs> Uh, Dub Tots isn't going to like this one. (laughs) There's 300 vehicular cyclists holed up at a two lane road, fending (laughs) off tens of thousands of Dutchmen. (laughs) Our sheriffs sheriffs will blot out the sun. Then we shall bike in the shade. (laughs) (laughs) I kind of love these guys now. They're fucking crazy. (laughs) So yeah, uh, vehicular cycling does tend to assume high speeds and a high degree of awareness and competency. Um, Forrester and the other vehicular cyclists did not ever expect cycling to become a mainstream mode of transportation but also thought it was important to fight viciously for their right to the road, right? Because they're, they're like, no, no, there's not that many crazy people out there like us. <laughs> <laughs> Almost sort of feels like a persecution complex, you know? <laughs> mm, a uh, bit. more Stop psychoanalyzing. Yeah. Man is not meant to psychoanalyze. <laughs> That's a good point. A good point. We, will kill, we will dig up Freud's corpse and kill him. Um, this, is, this is something I threw in the notes here. It probably should have been later, but... And, um, uh, Forrester did make some allowances uh, in his philosophy, like separate cycling facilities. But he said every facility for promoting cycling should be designed for thirty miles an hour. If not <laughs> thirty <laughs> miles per hour, okay. Can can somebody do a, 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 a kilometers here? Because this miles is killing me. What is thirty and thirty five and fifty kilometers, kilometers an hour? Now, Jesus Christ. Christ! Yeah, I was I was about to say uh, my top speed on a good day is probably eighteen. <laughs> And that's going downhill. <laughs> I, I, I think we gotta like, wh- why aren't there guys attacking this guy from his own side, like from the right, as it were? Why aren't there people going like, oh, only 35 miles an hour? <laughs> <laughs> you wanna have no. like a casual bike ride? You're basically standing still. <laughs> <laughs> 
every, every facility for promoting cycling should be designed for 30 miles an hour. If not, it will not attract the serious cyclist, and hence it will not be an effective part of the transportation system. A facility, so, a facility sorry. that is designed only for childlike and incompetent cyclists encourages the, <laughs> encourages the toy bicycle <laughs> attitude and discourages cycling transportation. This guy would have done great on Twitter. Oh, this guy would have executed to bots. fucking throwing like elbows and knee strikes. Yeah, yeah this guy right, there, right there on the Schuylkill River Trail, just yeah. like with spears attached to his handlebars. <laughs> so some sort of Maxim gun, if it fits. Yeah. So <laughs> e-bikes in Europe are limited speed, limited to twenty-five kilometers an hour. And and the and that's why no one cycling- cycles in Europe. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Exactly. John was they, right. It fails all this to time. attract at the, the, the serious cyclist. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Forrester's very opinionated. Now, yeah, really. During the same time, we start to, um, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials starts oh. to get interested in comprehensive bike infrastructure standards in the United States, right? Yeah, um, they got bored of being made fun of in the Cannonball Run movies, and they decided mm-hmm. to like do this instead. That's a nice Strode photo, by the way. I've oh, not yeah. seen that one before. That is, that's a solid Strode. It's even got like those, those fake old timey lights along the side. Hell yeah! Mm. So only one I, I, side. It's though. actually from the Wikipedia article for Strode. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Um. So Ashto is this sort of weird non-government organization, which is composed of state government transportation officials. Um, we talked about them in traffic engineering, right? right. In the traffic you, engineering, way back yeah. so it's six or something. You guys love to have like something that a federal agency should do, but then no one does, so it just turns out to be like a bunch of guys. Same with fire protection, fire now that protection, I think about it. Fire building codes. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. We'll have a commission about it, Alice. Ashto is at least sort of quasi-government. You know, fire protection, building codes, electrical codes, a, a, a huge amount of stuff involved with construction is is all run by basically private nonprofits composed of people who stand to make money off the standards. Um, right. <laughs> the international building code is very funny because it's only used in the United States. Um, yeah, I, I do love that like one. the World Series. Yes. Yeah. Hey, the Blue Jays are a team. Shut up. So yeah, Ashton, they, though? Ashto publishes suck, but. the book of standards for United States highways. That's uh, the Green Book, uh, the policy on the geometric. Oh, like the movie, yeah, exactly. Like no, this movie. is a different Green Book. No, shut up. This is one. this is a policy <laughs> on the geometric design of highways and streets. But in 1974, they released their first bicycle guide, right? And that was based on the recommendations of both the. Um, the study of uh, Davis bike lanes, right? Um, and um, I think it was uh, there was something else. I forget what it was, um, but it was mainly that, right? And they provided policies for separation of bicycle and motor traffic at specific traffic densities. Um, they 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 recommended bicycle lanes. They did not like protected bike lanes, uh, but they didn't prohibit them. Um, they had things in there that are now considered modern infrastructure, like offsetting lanes at intersections. You had provisions for the two-stage turn. You know, that's your bike box at the corner of the street, right? There's a bunch the of stuff Copenhagen that Copenhagen left, it's called sometimes. Yes. Um, what a lot of flavor. <laughs> <laughs> you see it in my smile. Um, <laughs> they had a bunch of stuff that was uh, well ahead of its time. Um, and Forrester was very unhappy with this. Um, hmm. And he decided to write his own psych, uh, bike in, uh, bicycle transportation textbook um, called the Cycle Traffic Engineering Handbook, um, which is now just called Bicycle Transportation. Um, and it looked like a textbook. It quacked like a textbook, but it wasn't really a conventional engineering textbook, right? Uh, it even says hmm. so in the introduction. <laughs> And so Forrester, you know, he spends a lot of his time not so much setting up engineering standards, standards as ruthlessly critiquing previous studies on protected bicycle infrastructure. Ruthless critique of all the bikes. He is a Marxist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of it's dishonest, some of it has uh, not great intellectual rigor. 
Um, there was a, <laughs> I unfortunately was not able to procure a copy of this before I um before we recorded this podcast, um, so I can't give a full expose on it. Um, there's a big focus in this textbook, though, on the safe and legal operation of bicycles rather than you know engineering, right? Um, there's there's a lot of it which really seems to be mostly like blog posts. Really, it, it's like where, where's the engineering part? It's like oh, traffic engineers should just keep doing what they're doing, and bikes should follow the rules of the road. Um, God damn it, John. So <laughs> this. This leads to a sort of information problem, right? There's been a whole bunch of studies that had been previously conducted that were in filing cabinets with various municipalities, right? Um, but John Forrester's book was on shelves in a store near you. So if you were a traffic engineer and you wanted to accommodate cyclists but wanted to stay up to date on the literature, there was only one easily available and up-to-date source to turn to, which was the Cycle Traffic Engineering Handbook. And it just happened to say, hey, just do whatever you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's fine. It's, We're it's all fine. good. All the cyclists yeah. are fine, man. It, just go ahead. It's fine. I believe there are a couple couple chapters farther in the book about, you know, some aspects of like sight lines and stuff like that, right? You know, but I, I, again, I was not able to procure a copy of the book. Um, but your cycling advocates, meanwhile, they were split on the vehicular cycling issue, right? Um, and that's at best. Um, at worst, you know, you had a, a cycling community that was small and insular, right? And so they were generally actively hostile to um, bike infrastructure. You know, they sort of share the opinions of John Forrester here because these are, again, proto-Lycra guys. Um, <laughs> and you also had direct resistance from within the traffic engineering community. There was a guy named Howard Munn, who was a Caltrans highway engineer, um, and he wrote a big paper for society, uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers, which essentially said, hey, it's the fucking 20th century. What are we doing building bike stuff? Right. <laughs> and um, you yeah, know, fuck off with your penny farthing. Yeah. And you have, uh, you have uh, highway engineers think, you know, these highways are built for people who pay, you know, gas tax. They're not for cyclists. Yeah. Right. You know, it's by the fact. Uh, cycle infrastructure is basically free, uh, even the really high quality stuff compared to road infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's these stories that you, you hear quite often about, like the history of how Copenhagen became so cycle friendly. It's basically because they were broke and it was back. You know, it, it's not America, so you can't just go borrow a whole bunch of money to do whatever the fuck you want anyway. They actually had to, like, come up with the money for stuff. And so they started encouraging people to get on bikes because it was way the hell cheaper. Yeah. Like literally one fiftieth the price Jeez. to build bike infrastructure. So they were like, yeah, we're totally fucking broke. Please ride your bike because we can afford that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's incredible how cheap this stuff is. Like I, I, your main, your main blocks are, you know, in the United States, at least it's politics. That's, that's the, the main problem. You, you know, you could, if you, if you remove the politics problem, you could, get a a full cycle lane system in a city the size of Philadelphia for probably less than a billion dollars. Um. Yeah, I've, I saw once uh, in, in years ago that was showing um, these various uh, projects. I wish I could find this again. These various projects in um, the U.S., like there was a turnpike in New Jersey, and they were measuring all the price of them in decades of the amount of money Copenhagen spends on all their bike bicycle infrastructure. And so they're like, <laughs> this turnpike costs 35 years of Copenhagen bicycle infrastructure. And, you know, this interchange <laughs> costs 15 years of Copenhagen bicycle infrastructure. It's ridiculous. Bizarre. But people still, you get this all the time too. People in North America say, oh, we don't have this money for the, for these bike stuff. Like, oh my God, this is going to cost $300,000 for this bike project. <laughs> and we're like, th this just shows that somebody that has absolutely no concept of how much money is spent on car infrastructure. There were people blaming the, uh, last week's Pittsburgh bridge collapse on the mayor installing bike lanes, uh, yeah. spending all the money on bike lanes. And I can tell you two things. Number one, Pittsburgh does not have enough bike lanes. Um, number yeah, two, those the bike, bike lanes had it too easy yeah. for too long. <laughs> number two, the, the bike lanes in Pittsburgh are incredibly cheap and low quality. Um, <laughs> they weren't spending very much money on them. 
<laughs> Every time uh, somebody's gone through and done the calculations, I, I need to make a video about this someday about basically <laughs> auditing all of this and saying, you know, a, a lot of the a lot of the infrastructure in the U.S. and Canada comes from property taxes too, right? Or sale local sales taxes, and so. It, if cyclists were made to pay their own way, then it's like, okay, tell me when I, when I get my refund. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in 1978, Caltrans was looking to develop a new bike guide, and this would be an actual engineering standard. They wanted input from cyclists. So they asked the California Association of Bicycling Organizations. Um, and that just happened to be headed by one John Forrester. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. This guy. Yeah. So. Proto tweeting his proto like or whatever beta symbiote thing. So he and some <laughs> of his colleagues testified to say that, you know, all this stuff we had studied before, it's clearly wrong. Here's all the reasons, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the guide they came up with rep rec recommended no separate facilities whatsoever, just better education of cyclists and better enforcement of the rules of the road, right? Um, and then, hey, but at least you got right turn on a red. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in 1981, Ashto revised its older bicycle guide. Um, and when they revised it, what really happened is they didn't know they had one before. Um, and they just oh, based, we, we found this yeah, in a filing yeah. cabinet. So they they based the new one largely on the 1978 Caltrans guide, um, also recommending no separate bicycle facilities, um, unless, as Forrester suggested, they were built to a design speed of 30 miles an hour. Oh my God! Oh, Jesus God. Christ, God, give it up! <laughs> so he it just is, wants to go fast, and he's getting older at this point, and he's still like, "No, yeah. I have to be able to go thirty miles an hour." Yes, and he he is um he he is uh what should we call it? this? A, a lot of this information came from uh I'm going to list the sources in the description because they're kind of a lot of them kind of obscure. This comes from like a, a long term comparison of various uh, Ashto policy guidelines and how how they were. Uh, immensely um, held back by just this this set of incidents here, but like you know, at this point, it's in the official engineering guide. The engineers have spoken. Separated bike infrastructure was bad. Bike lanes were bad. Vehicular cycling was good. It's science, right? Oh yeah, I mean, it, it, it became part of the highway code in the UK at about this time, I think. And you, you reach this period in the 1980s and the 1990s where um, vehicular cycling is seen as the only legitimate method of cycling, right? Um, Ashto explicitly prohibits bicycle infrastructure. Um, some cities try and install some bike infrastructure anyway, only on roads with, which aren't state highways because they would not be allowed to install it on state highways. These are very few and far between. No one's doing research because... The science was established by a guy uh, named John Forrester, who, <laughs> let me, let me, I, one thing which should be emphasized here is that he was not a um, practicing traffic engineer or civil engineer. He was an industrial engineer. Um, he just sort of came up with his own branch of engineering, uh, just sprung fully formed from his mind. Um <laughs> <sighs> And we also completely ignore international examples of bicycle infrastructure because this is the United States. We don't learn from international examples ever for anything. Um, Let's go John Earth, baby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What I also saw in, in some of the John Forrester discussions when I was reading up and reminding myself of this before the podcast um, was that he also would, would cherry pick statistics from other countries like yes. the Netherlands or the UK. And he would he would look at say crash statistics, but he he's looking at at um he's looking at for instance um the number of cycling deaths that might happen when you know almost the entire population all ages are cycling. You know, if somebody who's like eighty years old falls off their bike, they could very well die from a broken hip, right? Yeah. So he's comparing that to the very very small number of 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 incredibly fit 20 something men who are cycling in the United States saying see look it's safer RIP to your toddler but I'm built different <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. and well and then, and this is this is something I still see today all the time when 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 people sometimes still still people defend this stuff they they love looking at um they they love looking at statistics and they get the denominator wrong right so they'll do yeah. things like per capita 
but like when when 80 percent of the population is cycling versus like 0.6 percent of the population is cycling you can't just divide by the number of people and it, it it's these kind of statistics that Forrester and some of these guys were using to just it, it was just nonsense it was absolute nonsense and in fairness the Netherlands does have a huge cycling hazard that we don't have in the United States which is getting drunk and riding your bike into the I canal and drowning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, what, you know what's interesting is that uh, most of the people who drown in canals are drunk tourists here because one of the things the Netherlands does is right from when you're a child, uh, when you do your swimming lessons, you have to learn to swim in clothes. Uh, and they do this whole thing where they throw you into the pool with all of your clothes on. And, <laughs> and even... Yeah, they initially started <laughs> doing this as a prank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> And so you can go for your A, B, and C diploma. And when you do your C diploma as a kid, you literally have rain boots, a rain jacket, and they throw you in the pool and you got to get out. Um, so every single kid in the Netherlands, well, almost any of the kid that takes uh, swimming lessons any will kid learn that survives basically, this test. They, they, are, <laughs> they are teaching you. Yeah, it's survival of the fittest here, man. Yeah, like, well, we're back to John Forrester. We're doing Spartan shit once yeah. again. <laughs> <laughs> Any kid in the Netherlands is, is basically being trained to get drunk and fall in a canal. Every kid in the <laughs> Netherlands has killed another kid by throwing them into the canal. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very competitive system, yes. but we think it works well for us. Uh, you know what? It's called population control. <laughs> Leave your kids to die on the hillside like the Spartans did. It's fine. Exactly. Malthus, Malthus was Dutch, yeah. I think. <laughs> so, I. Uh, there's not a lot of research into cycling carrying it, being carried out in this era. Um, again, they're ignoring international examples. You know, you have this sort of uh, era where roadways are getting much bigger. You know, people are widening roads everywhere. Suburban sprawl increases to bizarre levels. You know, this is when these, 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 you know, you're building McMansions. They're like 5,000 square feet and they're like 40 miles from the city center. It's like, oh, you can just drive there every day. Oh, fuck it. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's fine. I yeah. love to, always use my card for everything and never get uh, a break from it. In in 1994, there was some federal funding that trickled into uh, bicycle infrastructure research, right? And the Federal Highway Administration published uh, a document called Effects of Bicycle Accommodations on Bicycle Slash Motor Vehicle Safety and Traffic Operations, right? So they're trying to... With that famous wit for which the federal government is known. Yes. So they, they, they undertook studies to determine the effect of the very small amount of cycle infrastructure that existed in the United States at that point, right? And this uh, document wound up concluding that there's uh, three types of cyclists. They call them group A, B, and C. Aries, Capricorn, uh, and INTJ. Yes. So A is your confidence cyclists, right? And B and C are basic and child, respectively, right? I'm and, a basic cyclist. Yeah. And <laughs> Group A, which all cycle guides at this point had assumed to be the default, proved to be about 5% of all cyclists, right? <laughs> that, that makes sense. Yeah. The study recommended further study of accommodating these other users. And uh, Forrester was apoplectic, right? Yeah. How dare you call me a crank? <laughs> I dare you call me a small minority of people who want to ride bikes. Yeah. Said this policy assumes that the BC group will continue to be the large majority for whom the entire system must be designed. In effect, no, the- we can we can <laughs> strengthen we can strengthen cyclists. We can teach them to be chads like can, me can, by <laughs> making everything remain dangerous. We can turn this child into a space marine cyclist. <laughs> <laughs> we throw him into the bike lane wearing <laughs> rain gear. <laughs> wearing rain gear. <laughs> <laughs> in effect, the FHWA advocates dumbing down the cycling traffic system to suit the desires of the least competent possible users. Jesus Christ, guy. <laughs> <laughs> this guy takes ableism to a whole new level. Like, <sighs> Listen, cycling is just... Bike, but it's me, it's the Forester Lane. <laughs> it's just <laughs> for able-bodied white men in Lycra. You gotta realize that. The Dutch, they're doing it wrong. Um, yeah, this clearly. is our thing. Um, not yours. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, uh, follow my barstool sports column. Um, <laughs> Shut the hell up. 
been doing battle with these people for two days, man. So um, uh, Forrester uh, decides to publish a new edition of Cycling Transportation Handbook, right? Now with a, a whole set of chapters with scathing criticism of the Dutch cycle path system, which he said was unsafe, it deterred cyclists through low speeds and indirect routes, and it reduced cyclist competence, right? Um, you know, okay, I, John. And this was... <laughs> This was uh, one thing. One thing about John Forrester is he never visited the Netherlands. No, I was say. <laughs> really, I'm so surprised. <laughs> so, but he did have sort of the tide turning here. You know, there was actual research into prefer- uh, into cycling, how to improve it, how what people actually wanted. Um, in 1999, Ashto dropped its outright prohibition on bicycle facilities. Um, it was becoming harder and harder to ignore evidence from Europe on the effectiveness and safety of cycle infrastructure, right? Um, and another thing that influenced this was the formation of NACTO, right? This is the National Association of City Transportation Officials, right? Who were sort of a group of people who were very frustrated with the Ashto standards, which also prohibited things like um, wide sidewalks, bus lanes, transit ways. All this stuff was basically explicitly illegal, right? Yeah, and so as, as Americans, all you could do is found a competing you sort of a, private you have a, organization. A competing, <laughs> a competing quasi-government agency with the existing oh one. <laughs> We're going to have commissioners meetings about it. Yeah, I think it'd be funny Nothing. if they just started having fist fights. Um, <laughs> that would be tight. I do like that. So they wanted more appropriate standards for urban streets and roads because before Ashto would come in and say, well, this is a nice tree-lined, quiet residential street. Anyway, add six <laughs> lanes and increase the speed limit to 60 miles an hour. <laughs> Make it sound like the mob there. This is a nice tree-lined street you got here. It'd yeah. be a shame if something would have uh, happened. Put a highway yeah. through it. <laughs> Run a road yeah. through here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So this is, uh, you know, they, they want to develop standards for transitways, busways, neighborhoods, slow streets, traffic calming, and of course, bicycle lanes. Um, and this was sort of a, a risky move at the time because Ashto says these are all highly illegal, right? Um, and what that highly meant- Highly illegal. Highly illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that meant that cities were opening themselves up to liability by adding these yeah. features. Um, you could be yep. sued for an accident that would occur on these non-standard streets. Even if you could demonstrate that it was objectively safer than the standard, the non-standard street was uh, uh, going to get you thrown into court, right? It's the American way. <laughs> yes. And this was, um, this, this was something that was, it was a big problem for a long time. I mean, I hate to give it to him, but one of the guys who was very good at breaking this uh, sort of situation was um michael bloomberg uh <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah um you know with the the really big build out of um bike infrastructure in new york city and you know that and so on and so forth how much does that hurt you to say ross <laughs> well you know <laughs> well it wasn't cuomo yeah it wasn't cuomo you know we've been sort of cl- slowly clawing our way back to the standard set in 1972 ever since there have been Two further updates, the Ashto bike guidelines in 2012 and 2018. Um, they really softened the vehicular cycling provisions. Um, and they, they, they will now allow a separated bike lane, a protected uh, bike lane. They allow that's it. That's so nice of them. They don't encourage <laughs> it, though. Um, <laughs> they have many specific policy recommendations mm-hmm. against it. But they do Thinking allow once it again now. of the like very sort of shriveled up Bojack guy who's like healthcare please, but he's asking for a protected bike lane. <laughs> um, and you have uh, bicycling is becoming popular again. You know, it's becoming a more mainstream mode of transportation in the United States. They're very slowly installing infrastructure everywhere. Of course, this is a terrible time to be building infrastructure because uh, you just need so much goddamn public comment. My God, you know, everyone wants their parking spot. Um, <laughs> and as a result, that stuff that's being implemented is very fractured, very disconnected. You have traffic engineers designing this stuff who have very little cycling experience, certainly don't yeah. bike themselves. Um, and doing, getting from one place to another sort of requires doing, you know, a bunch of illegal stuff if you're on a bike. 
you know, if you're if you're biking in an American city that doesn't have a fully built out bicycle network, which is all of them, um, you know, what's uh, the thing you're supposed to do that's legal, the thing you're supposed to do that's implied by the lane striping and the thing that's you're you should do to remain safe are three different things. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. And it's, and you yeah, ha- it's you true have to make Canada like too. how many of those decisions per minute? Yeah. Oh my god. Uh, it's 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 not good. I I think one of the one of the criticisms that Forrester had about like um you know these these separated lanes being, you know, unsafe um cuz later in his life he he sort of softened on the idea of the dutch cycleway system right um that, but one of the criticisms we had was that you know it would just confuse and disorient people and lead them to do unsafe things because it's not necessary necessarily clear what you're supposed to do and the current fractured bike lane system does that consistently everywhere yeah for um, sure <laughs> It, it, it it's something that because we don't have a method of creating like out of thin air or even creating a comprehensive plan to install bike lanes bicycle facilities throughout a city you, you, you're you're kind of you're, you're stuck um yeah so <laughs> what the netherlands did here is in in the 80s mostly they created a bicycle design guidelines but what was really important here is that it was done at a national level so it was the these are the national standards and they had proper bike facilities yeah, we don't put have in. those yeah no shit yeah <laughs> and, <laughs> and and the and like the nimbies it, it is it's so fucking ridiculous in the u.s and canada that every time you want to put in bicycle infrastructure you need to go through a community engagement meetings and every retired asshole will come out to these meetings that are held at 3 p.m on a tuesday yep and and they will complain about it because, of course, they don't ride bicycles. Um, but in the Netherlands, it was just a national standard. So every single time a road was uh, built or rebuilt, which, you know, happens every 25 to 35 years for any street, yep. it would just get the new updates. And you see this all throughout Amsterdam. You'll see stuff that was built in the 90s to one standard, in the early 2000s to another standard, in the 2010s to another standard. It got better and better as time went on, but it just got built that way by default. So every time there was a new road resurfacing, there were proper cycle facilities put in. And then you basically get it for free because you got to rebuild your road anyway. So if you rebuild it with the curb here instead of there, it's just the same cost. Um, And that's the way they did it here. And you're kind of seeing this in the U.S. in Massachusetts because they actually have pretty decent bike design guidelines that came out in, I think, 2015. And they're doing kind of the same thing. That They do have the NIMBYs and there, there's some, there's still those American issues. But, but in general, when streets are rebuilt, this is the standard. The traffic engineers, you know, check off this, 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 and this, and it just gets rebuilt better. Yeah. And that's really the way it has to work. We have a wonderful situation here in Philadelphia right now, which is um, the uh, Washington Avenue, which is a main east-west uh. street, is being repaved, and they want to restripe it. And they went through a community engagement process. No, for, for fucking restriping. <laughs> Jesus for, for Christ. Twice they went through they it going, twice. Well, they were going from five lanes to three lanes, right? They went through a community engagement process. They conducted surveys for two and a half years. The community was well in favor of the three lane option with the two protected bike lanes. Um, then the pandemic hit and they decided this was a reason to do the entire community ga- engagement process over again, which took another two and a half years leading to the same result. And um, well, next week they're going to have a private meeting with some community leaders to give them an excuse to go with the five lane option. Yeah. with No bike lanes. <laughs> It's, it's really despicable. Yeah, I just keep doing the study over again until you get the result you want. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds familiar. Yeah, so John Forrester died in 2020, uh, late 2020, I believe. After a very yeah. long, fulfilling life of trying to make Apoplexy. every every single cyclist uh, live by a sort of warrior's code. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> 
the warrior coat of cycling. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. And listen, then- it, it's 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 three simple rules. Um you take the lane. Respect the emperor as a living god and yes. expel the foreign barbarians. Yes, <laughs> yeah, checks out. I don't know. I, I, it leads us to like some questions on uh, the, 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 the cycling in general. Like, like we 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 did all this, you know. And you wonder how many excess deaths are a result of just not going with the yeah the provisions that were correct in the first place. Like, you know, and you still have folks who say vehicular cycling is best and it's like is this supposed to be a hobby or a means of transportation well the the big issue with the vehicular cycling is that if you if you live in a car infested shithole as i have done Mm -hmm. in various times in my life and you're going to ride a bicycle then yeah vehicular cycling is a good idea like you can't really argue with that but when it becomes like public policy it's fucking stupid Yes. Yeah, I mean, you can't you can't run a whole like uh, infrastructure policy on the concept of get good. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can try, and we have for many many years. Yeah, but this totally plays into the Canadian and American idea of the personal responsibility, and you know, wow. if everybody just followed the rules, we'd all be, you know, th- this is absolutely pervasive throughout North American culture. Yeah, and I got two graphs up here. This is. Uh, pedestrian and cyclist fatality uh, rates in the USA um, versus all of Europe from 1990 to 2018. I'll put a link to the study in the description. You can see that um, yeah. you know, since since uh, cycling has become more popular in the USA, we've actually increased our per capita um, fatality rate. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side, we see cyclist fatality rate per 100 million kilometers cycled um and this is uh the first graph is 2000 to 2002 the second one's 2008 to 2010 the third one's 2016 to 2018 we've also managed to increase that relative to Mm -hmm. where we were um and it's i don't know it's 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 bizarre i guess this is in the united states i guess this is mostly because our our road vehicles are so much more dangerous um yeah, yeah i mean even if you looked at the 1970s vehicular cycling um even if it was a good idea then yeah and it wasn't but even if it was a good idea vehicles have gotten bigger vehicles have gotten more powerful smartphones and distracted driving have increased substantially there's a lot more traffic on the road today than there was in the 1970s yeah, but like a, a tesla that's reasons. gonna lock onto you and Fuck. smash into you <laughs> <Jesus Christ. laughs> like the, it's just the the situation out there on the roads is night and day different than it was in the 1970s so even if this was a good idea which it wasn't yeah it sure as hell wouldn't be a good idea I mean, how, how are you gonna bike through like a diverging diamond interchange I, or like, Jesus a, Christ. Or, Very or like a, a michigan <laughs> left <laughs> Like, <laughs> you know, um, what's interesting here about this, this second graph you have, um, the, in the Netherlands, um, bicycle fatalities have increased. I think it was two years ago. They increased for the first time since the 1970s. And, uh, when you dig into the data, it's entirely due to senior citizens on e-bikes. Wow. That is the only place the, the bump came from, but it came because what happens is that you get these. Dutch people who have been cycling since they were literally three years old and they've been cycling all their life. They're very confident, but then as they get older, their reflexes get slower and they're not as good as they used to be. They can't keep up the 35 miles per hour that they did throughout all of their life. Like John Forrester. (laughs) And now they get on these e-bikes that allow them to go like as fast as they used to. Well, maybe not quite as fast as their 35 kilometer per hour and their John Forrester days, but the, but then they, they get themselves in trouble basically. And so it, it's interesting because I've also seen people come along and say, well, you know, bicycle fatalities are increasing. There were, there were these news articles that more people died on bicycles than in cars for the first time in the Netherlands since forever ago. Um, but yeah, it's entirely due to seniors on e-bikes, but it, that's interesting to me because that's a demographic that doesn't exist outside of the Netherlands basically, or maybe, yeah. Uh, Denmark, um, that demographic, you will not get an 80 year old on an e-bike in the United States. 
Yeah, I, I mean it's a, it's a it's a sign that like you know folks are using the system, you know, and and you're starting off so much lower than everywhere else. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's kind of like that, well, that something like that can in, can influence the the overall numbers. Sometimes the statistics fluctuate. <laughs> <laughs> now, now here's an interesting one: is that we now have a cadre of autonomous car vaporware guys, right? Mm. Who want to ban non-autonomous vehicles from roadways? So, yeah. was was John Forrester right to? <laughs> To campaign oh, for cyclists right John, to the John road. Forrester advancing towards an autonomous vehicle uh, at 35 miles an hour with a drawn katana. Gigantic fucking claymore. I, I don't know. Like, I don't know what the AI of a self-driving car would identify John Forrester as because it, would be, it would be All unlike threat. anything it had ever seen before. Tier one threats, yes. It would be right, like, this is clearly a military be. jet of some kind. Yeah. <laughs> It's the only thing that matches the profile in the in the uh, machine learning. Start running away. Start driving away. I can't deal Your with this. Your Tesla guy. just backs up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a horse. Just gets startled. <laughs> Shit. Well, that was vehicular cycling. What did we learn? I I am I was right to never cycle. Um, I'm a pussy for not going 35 miles per hour. Yeah, mm-hmm, I mean, you need to mm-hmm. you need to that thir- you need to go like like fifty miles an hour on your bike. Like, uh, get get a do you like that guy who broke the wor- world's first cycling record and have like a a train right ahead of you as a blocker <laughs> and ride on a wooden pathway right. in between the tracks and go like sixty five. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, all right, let's all. Let's all start vehicular cycling. I'm going to go find the densest <laughs> truck route I can find tomorrow. Oh, yeah. I'm going to thrust myself. Well, in there's Northfield t- Drive in Waterloo. <laughs> yeah. Everybody take the lane. Yes. Take the lane, everyone. What I, what I learned is I do not regret leaving. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We have a section on this podcast called Safety Third. Shake hands with danger. Greetings. Ooh, I like this. Well, there's your problem crew and possible guest. Hi, Hello, thanks. possible guest. <laughs> I love the show, and I especially love the Marathon Titanic episode. I've used that one specifically to get people into WTYP, since it's such a good listen on a really long drive. Keep up the good work. Mm. When I was fresh out of school at 22 years old, I worked at a company that designed systems for the automotive industry. Oh, no. Since I studied something not engineering related, I had a lot of on-the-job training, that's in air quotes, also known as reading safety articles and patching a loose framework together to keep people safe. As the lab manager, this also included some of the systems that involved our ISO and AEC, that's automated qualification tests, right? Hmm. One of the things you have to do when you develop products for cars is test them in a crazy range of temperatures. We were required to conduct testing from as high as 180 degrees Fahrenheit to as low as negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which, gee, what the fuck does Tesla do then? <laughs> not do that. <laughs> you that. Simply not do those things. When you, it, it's fine. It's designed for a range of 60 to 85 Fahrenheit. That's fine for it, all of California. It's, yeah, it's designed for anything California will ever see. 72 <laughs> degrees and sunny. <laughs> When you have a, for example, a camera in the trunk of a black car on a 115 degree day in Arizona, it can easily reach over 150 degrees, if not more. Similar, similarly, in upstate New York or Canada or Russia, where it's absolutely brick, I, I think that they, means very cold. That but... means very cold. Yes, negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit is quite easily attained. Anyway, they tasked me with getting a previously owned temperature test chamber working. Getting the 240 volt high amperage outlet for the high temperature uh, was no problem. However, when it came to getting the cold temperature testing working, several issues popped up. Because the system used liquid nitrogen in order to do the cooling. Hell yes. It required a liquid nitrogen uh, dewar. Dewar? Dewar? It's this thing here. 
Okay. I don't yes. know. It's not Dutch. I can't pronounce yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, I was informed this came in a 1,200 pound, 230 liter uh, doer, right? The reason this is dangerous is that nitrogen gas is a simple asphyxiant that displaces oxygen with an expansion radio of 1 to 696. So, 230 liters of liquid nitrogen can boil off to generate 160,000 liters of gas, enough to basically kill everyone in the office, if not more. Fuck. <laughs> Do that, not spill. But that would never happen. No. Foreshadowing. Good. <laughs> See below for an illustration of the big, thick, cold boy. That's that's right here, right? Oh, I'm gonna freak out of that. <laughs> now, the first problem came in the form of decisions made by management. Wow, I never would have expected that. Yeah, um, that that's <laughs> a new for this one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Due to the size and weight of an uh, an occurrence of earthquakes in the part of the world I was in, <laughs> the liquid nitrogen do door had to be braced to the wall. We were informed by the building engineers that this would require removing the wall, drilling into the steel girders from, that form the skeleton of the building, then reinstalling the drywall, hopefully using a curtain to mitigate dust migration into our test lab. Now, that sounds like a job that's about like a weekend at worst, right? Um, <laughs> and I even said this would be about $17,000. But during the meeting, a bargain at any price. That's yes. That's that's probably a little more than I would think, but probably fine. I, if you're doing testing, you know, you want the good stuff. During the meeting, yeah, and if you if you're in a sort of situation where you have one of these lying around, that's pocket change to you. Yeah. It has to be. Yeah. Well, during a meeting, I was told this was too expensive. When I pointed out that seventeen thousand dollars was about what a brand new test chamber would cost that used electric heating and cooling. I was also told that was too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> that we just run the existing chamber using the liquid nitrogen and skip the safety bracing. You just staple it to the wall, it's fine. Yeah, just put a... Put a zip ties, zip ties. Yeah, zip put, ties, yeah. Put a ratchet strap around it. Um, <laughs> I objected, but at this point in my career, I didn't have the figurative balls to seriously put my foot down on safety. I obtained in writing from the CEO that this step should be skipped and sent a contemporary, contemporaneous email to myself, noting that I had, in fact, objected. Always a good idea, you know? Mm, uh, that's shit in writing. Right. Yeah. yeah. Problem two is that this test lab really was not set up with ventilation. Now, the problem is that when the test chamber runs, it circulates liquid nitrogen into the chamber, where it converts to a gas, taking heat away as it boils off, which is very effective. However, that gas goes out the back and is supposed to go into some kind of piping to carry the gas away. In our lab, this was not possible. So oh. I had a fan blow air into the corner and mix up the nitrogen gas and a portable Jesus. oxygen content <laughs> sensor. The windows in this building were locked after we were on the 10th floor, right? Now, before we go, I want to state this is not the kind of safety conditions and procedures I want, that I wanted or would put up with now years later. But as a new grad being pushed al along by industry veterans, I thought, hey, you know, this is how it goes. Um, and this is embarrassing. And, you know, for anyone listening, you should never tolerate that kind of crap. Your gut feeling is usually correct. Mm -hmm. The final problem that sets up our incident was that the uh, doer slowly boiled off uh, it would generate gas inside, right? Uh, that gas formed the pressure that actually pushed the liquid content out into the chamber. There were two pressure relief valves installed on the chamber. Uh, I requested on my orders that the first one be at 50 PSIG. I don't know what PSIG is. Um, Pounds per square inch per... Uh, PSI gauge? PSI gauge. Gram? Yeah, that could be it. I am. The first one's at 50, the second one's at 85. This would ensure it never got too much pressure. However, on the delivery, at the time in question, the company we brought in, the company brought in, delivered with an 85 PSI and a 300 PSI valve. Fine. Okay. Close enough. I needed the doer for tests and accepted it. Overnight, the pressure built up well beyond 85 PSI, 
because the valve was stuck due to the low temperature, which mm -hmm. you think they would have anticipated for a liquid nitrogen container, but I, what do I know? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> during a test, we had a field engineer who we'll call Tom, even though his name is Paul. <laughs> I like that. It was very keen to get his face as close as possible to the chamber window during the temperature pull down, despite my repeated insistence that he not do that, since he would basically be breathing in a ton of nitrogen and not much oxygen. He brushed me off and continued, which is always a good thing to do when the lab safety manager tells you to do something. After about two minutes, he stood up rapidly began to ask a question and immediately passed out. <laughs> Not ideal. On the way down, his Rolex on his wrist, wrist nice. smacked the pressure relief valve, which immediately unstuck, went to full <laughs> open, and began <laughs> Yo, if he died, <laughs> can I have his Rolex? <laughs> and oh began, my god. <laughs> began venting nitrogen gas into the room at around 200 pound, 250 no. pounds per square inch. I, I, I have a question, and I know, I, the thing is, there's no answer in the thing, but I know in my heart. And my question is, what model of Rolex? And the answer that I know in my heart is Milgauss. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I don't wear time bracelets. <laughs> Everything's coming up Milgauss. <laughs> the oxygen mm. content alarm on the other side of the room almost immediately being on screaming, showing the O2 content was about 13%, which is well below the normal air percentage of 21%. I immediately ordered everyone out and helped drag Tom into the hallway, then went back in and attempted to stop the valve from blasting out nitrogen. Please no, do not do this. Uh, do not do this. Do not do this. <laughs> Evacuate the building and call the fire department. Yeah, well, don't even do that. Just wait, wait for it to dissipate. Just, 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 just bricks, walk away. Yeah, just, just walk away. Just walk Never away. Ch 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 just change your name. Yeah. Move to a cabin yeah. in the woods in Gone. northern Finland. <laughs> <laughs> get get a bunch of like sled dogs. Yeah, did, yeah go, just start go, carving shit. Go deliver, I, go deliver, deliver some medicine to some children in a remote village. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Throw out like a really long beard, so no one recognizes you. Do some, yeah. do some ice fishing and drink some vodka. <laughs> <laughs> Cycle away at thirty five miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> Cycles away from the scene at an extremely <laughs> high speed. <laughs> Witnesses saw a fighter jet leaving the scene. <laughs> Let me tell you about VTOL. <laughs> it was incredibly stupid and dangerous on my part, considering the low O2 content in the room. Once I began to feel slightly woozy myself, I went to the other side of the room, grabbed the fire extinguisher, and bash the window lock until the window was able to be low opened and ventilated the room with fresh air from outside using the fan. Hell yeah. After about one minute, the pressure subsided and the room air returned to normal over the next 10 minutes. I, in turn, as you'd expect from idiots, received a scolding from my manager and from the head of HR for bashing the window out, to which I pro to which what? I promptly laid into them with about the most anger I've ever allowed myself to show at work, which included the sentence, negligent safety process and procedures to a level of criminal neg negligence. Yep. <laughs> yep. Considering someone could have been killed or injured worse by simply, simply passing out in a worse place and hitting their head. Um, now, of course, they wanted to charge me for breaking the window, at which point <laughs> I told them that if they attempted to punish me, I would resign immediately and report them to the state OSHA office. Uh, They've done it anyway, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. they backed off. In retrospect, I should have done that anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. However, about two weeks later, I got a job offer from a much better company that sells fruit, and left, transferring my safety responsibilities to someone who, as far as I know, never made any safety improvements to that system. I, no, I submitted a report with a lengthy list of changes, top of which was to abandon the liquid nitrogen system altogether and buy an electric chamber. And so it continued to be used literally as it was that day for years, down to the, my same safety presentation that still had my name on it. Oh my God. Wonderful. 
The lesson I want to convey here is that safety matters and is worth threatening or indeed resigning over. Stand up for what you believe is right when it comes to dangerous things, because even if someone doesn't die, they can still be seriously injured or sue you. Luckily, nothing like that happened in this case, but it was very much a wake-up call to me and empowered me to take more of a stand on safety and not put up with management skimping on things that exist to protect workers. Hell yeah. All the best and keep up the great show. Anonymous. Fantastic. That was good good safety third. That was a a really good one, yeah. Don't don't die. Don't don't inha- don't inhale a bunch of liquid nitrogen. Well, the other and, thing, well, gaseous nitrogen, I guess. But what what would happen if he had just uh, got good? <laughs> <laughs> that's true, right? Yeah, that's true. What if what I if he just like thing, right? moved through the room, perfectly dodging every nitrogen <laughs> molecule like the <laughs> Matrix? If if they were all going thirty five miles per hour, this wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that was. Safety third. <laughs> Shake hands with danger. Our next episode is on the Boston Molasses Disaster. Does anybody have any commercials yes, before we go? Trash Future, Kill James Bond, 10,000 Losses, uh, Lions, Lions Led by Donkeys, donkeys. Uh, uh, Do yeah. Not Eat's YouTube channel. Uh, Jason, uh, if they want more Jason, where can they find you? What do you not do? Not just bikes. You can Notch check bikes. out Nosh's Bikes, bikes. on YouTube or NJB Live if you want to see my bicycle live streams in the Netherlands. But you, I'm not just bikes on pretty much every platform. Now, are, are you going? Oh, yeah. Are you going at least 35 miles an hour on these live streams? I am not going oh. 35 miles per hour because I am a wimp. <laughs> uh, so if you want to see some weak shit, <laughs> exactly. You want to see some pansy ass cycling <laughs> that has John Forrester rolling in his grave. You can come Roll, check rolling, out me. Rolling at an angular velocity of 35 <laughs> miles per hour. <laughs> Never stop, John. Keep moving. <laughs> For every cyclist going under that speed, I go one mile an hour faster. <laughs> <laughs> he needs nuclear power. You just fucking use oh, him to boil shit. some water. Just hook him up to a turbine. <laughs> All right. Well... That was, a, that was a good sized podcast. Yeah, that was good. Yes, it was. That was, that was yes, longer was. than I thought it would, yeah. would be, but uh, hey, that's vehicular cycling. That would be the case. I mean, if we had gone 35 miles an hour, it probably would have been shorter. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it would have yeah, been yeah, like well. 10 minutes long. John Forrester was there hours ago. <laughs> All right. Well, bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Uh, bye. Thanks so much. <laughs>